Hello everyone. A very good evening to all of you. Am I live? Am I visible? Let me confirm. If I'm visible, am I am live? You can see me. You can hear me. I will start the class ahead. You have to give me a minute to confirm. Yes, I guess it's working. Okay, give me one more minute. Why it's not showing here? Yes. So I welcome you all for today's session. A very, very good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Priyanka Sachdev here. And today I am here to continue my series of pharmacology which we have started in the morning. In the morning we have started antimicrobial drugs in the pharmacology. Right. So we have completed all the drugs, all the antimicrobial drugs which inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. That was covered in episode 1 of antimicrobial drugs. I taught you how to make the tables, the comparative tables between various chapters. So we have already covered sulfonamides, trimethoprim and quinolones. In episode 1, I told you how to make this comparative analysis between the various drugs. Right, these are the master tables. Believe me, once you make these tables, your tables are ready now. You can revise entire chapters in just 5 minutes. Just revise this table. Any MCQ based on these chapters, you can crack it. That is my guarantee. Right. In episode number one, we have covered these three uh, chapters. That is the drugs which inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. That is sulfonamide, trimethoprim and quinolones. And the combination of sulfonamide and trimethoprim, cotrimoxazole was also discussed in episode number one. In episode number two, in the afternoon, we have discussed these four chapters. We have already discussed uh, uh, the, the drugs which inhibit protein synthesis. We have discussed four drugs, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, aminoglycoside and erythromycin. In episode number two, we have discussed this and we have made this comparative table, the master table. In episode number 3, we have discussed beta lactams. We have discussed the penicillins in detail and mechanism of action of all other beta lactams. And now it's episode 4. So in this episode 4, I am starting the specific, specific antimicrobial drugs. So I will start with ATT, anti-tubercular drug, which will continue with DORS, the DORS regimen in RNTCP. Right. First I will continue this. Then I will move to anti-leprosy drug. Then I will move to anti-malarial drug. And if time allows, we will move to antiviral and antiparasitic also. So five chapters are there that is specific antimicrobial drugs. Let me start with anti-tubercular drugs without wasting any further time. So stay connected and see. So let me start anti-tubercular drugs. Before coming on the anti-tubercular drugs, as the name indicates, anti-tubercular drugs are the drugs which are against tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria. The name of the bacteria is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So all the drugs which I am going to discuss in this chapter, that is ATT, anti-tubercular agents, ATT, anti-tubercular drugs or anti-tubercular agents that are supposed to kill this bacteria, either kill this bacteria or inhibits the growth of this bacteria. So they should be either bactericidal or bacteriostatic for this particular bacteria. So before studying the details of the drugs, it's important to study the structure of this bacteria. So, okay, let me draw the structure of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes tuberculosis. So, this is the bacteria. This is the cell membrane of the bacteria. So, this is the cell wall of the bacteria. And inside this, this is the nucleus having double-stranded DNA. Listen, so you can see it is a simple structure, but the cell wall is unique. The cell wall doesn't contain peptidoglycan like gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The cell wall here is unique. Can you see the cell wall? It is unique. It contains two different components. What are the components which are present in the cell wall? The cell wall contains, the mycobacterial cell wall contains two different components. It contains mycolic acid and it contains arabinogalactan. Now to understand how cell wall is synthesized, you have to understand how mycolic acid is synthesized and you have to understand how arabinogalactan is, uh, is synthesized, right? Why I am telling you this before the starting of the chapter? I am going to teach you five primary drugs. That is, Isoniazid, Rifamsin, Pyrazinamide, Ethambidol and Streptomycin. We all know that these are five first line drugs in antitubercular agents. That is HRZES. We will be discussing these in a comparative table. Now out of these five, three of them act by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis of the bacteria. So the H, H that is Isoniazid, Isoniazid, Pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. These three inhibit cell wall synthesis in the bacteria. So you have to understand the structure of the cell wall. Otherwise, you cannot understand the mechanism of action of isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. So before starting the chapter, that's why I'm teaching you the structure of the cell wall. In the structure of the cell wall, two components are there, arabinogalactan and mycolic acid. Right. 
arabino gallitan is made up of arabinos and galactose and the enzyme required for formation of arabino gallitan is only one that is arabinoside transferase by this enzyme arabino gallitan is formed coming on mycolic acid mycolic acid is formed by acetyl coa and two two enzymes are required first acetyl coa get converted into fatty chain and then converted to mycolic acid here two enzymes are required fast one and fast two that is fatty acetyl fatty acyl synthetase one and fatty acyl synthetase two these two enzymes are required now see the three drugs what i am telling you h that is isoniazid inhibit this enzyme that is the mechanism of action of isoniazid z that is pyrazinamide inhibit this enzyme that is the mechanism of action of pyrazinamide and ethambutol e inhibits this enzyme so out of the five the mechanism of, act of action of three drugs is over can you see so either h or z or e that is isoniazid pyrazinamide or uh, or ethambutol is given so cell wall synthesis cannot occur either the mycolic acid is not formed or arabino gallitan is not formed since cell wall is not formed the bacteria will die the bacteria will die right because of inhibition of cell wall synthesis so that is the structure of the cell wall do you got it have you got it so shall i continue shall i continue yes anju i teach both patho pharma as well as micro as well as medicine right so continuing with pharma uh, so fatty acyl synthetase 1 and 2 these are required for mycolic acid synthesis and arabinoside transferase is required for arabino gallitan synthesis right so coming on att directly starting att anti tubercular drug two types of drugs are there first line and second line see the classification of the first line and second line in the first line there are five drugs as i have told you isoniazid is written as h rifampicin is written as r pyrazinamide is written as z z ethambutol is written as e and streptomycin is written as s so h r z e s we will be studying these in a comparative table right coming on the second line drugs second line drugs are divided into three categories few of them are fluoroquinolones today in episode 2 i taught you in episode 1 i taught you quinolones the fluoroquinolones so it is oxoflox levoflox moxiflox ciprofloxx four flocks are there o levo moxi and cipro these four flocks are are there in fluoroquinolones in these fluoroquinolones apart from fluoroquinolones we have aminoglycosides aminoglycosides are always injectable today i taught you aminoglycosides are always injectable so carnamycin amikacin and capreomycin these three are the injectable streptomycin apart from it other drugs are there you can learn the name of the others also right so ethionamide prothionamide cyclosirin there are many others also you can understand that also everyone give me a thumbs up everyone everyone so man pex i am teaching currently tb and leprosy philhal mam i am teaching the drugs of that right so uh, currently i will not shift on the patho but yeah in future i will plan the classes on tb and lepra and i am already having the links with me you can ask on the telegram i will share the links of the recordings with you of tb and lepra of pathology anyways let me continue here with att drugs this is the classification so what are first line and what are second line so any patient coming to me diagnosed as tb any patient i will start with first line i will give five drugs in the treatment h r z e s why they are first line because they have high efficacy right and very low toxicity and these are used routinely but sometime the patient have resistance for the first line the patient is not responding to the first line then we use second line these are the reserve drugs routinely we don't use second line they have low efficacy and high toxicity we use only when first line is not working and patient has having resistance for the first line that is the meaning of the first line and second line you got my my point so how many first line drugs are there the first line drugs are five and second line drugs are many let me do the classification first line drug are five h r z e s can you tell me what are they h is isoniazid r is rifampicin z is pyrazinamide e is ethambutol and s is streptomycin these are five first line okay listen from the first line these four are oral these four are oral coming in the form of the tablets the streptomycin is a aminoglycoside i taught you today aminoglycosides in protein synthesis inhibitors right so streptomycin is injectable the streptomycin is injectable you got my point coming on second second line in the second line i will divide second line into three categories fluoroquinolones strept uh, aminoglycosides the injectable and others in others in fluoroquinolones how many fluoroquinolones you know there are four fluoroquinolones which are used here so the four fluoroquinolones are oflox levoflox moxiflox ciprofloxx three aminoglycosides are there carnamycin amikacin and capreomycin now please everyone here see 
in the second line also we are having injectable amino glycoside in the first line also we are having injectable amino glycoside in the first line we are having only one streptomycin in the second line we are having three carnamycin amikacin and capreomycin injectables are amino glycosides amino glycosides are always injectable you got my point so that is the first classification there is one more classification in which ATT is divided into five groups learn both classification so this is group one group two group three group four group five what does group one contain group one contain all first line but oral one so from HRZES, S is removed because S is, S is injectable. I told you. So only HRZE is included in group 1. In group 2, we are including all injectable from the first line also, second line also. So from the first line, streptomycin and from the second line, three other amino glycoside. Carnamycin, amikacin, trepiromycin. So all injectables are taken together. In group 3, we are taking all fluoroquinolones. The same four fluoroquinolones. Oflox, levoflox, moxiflox, ciproflox. Right. So these are the four fluoroquinolones. Group 4 is others, others and group 5 is unclear efficacy. So that is the two type of classification we have done. We can convert the, we can mix the two type of classification. Now in this classification, tell me, tell me where is group 1. I guess this is group 1. Group 1 is oral first line. Where is group 2? Group 2 is complete injectable. So injectable from here also, injectable from here also. This is group 2. Am I right? Come on the group 3. Where is group 3? Group 3 is fluoroquinolones. Am I right? Come on group 4. Where is group 4? Group 4 is others. Where is group 5? Group 5 is not here. It is unclear efficacy. So this is how we are converting. We are com we are combining the two classification. So there are two classification. The first classification is first line, second line. And the second classification is group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Everyone. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Shall I start? I request all the students to make this comparative table with me. I will be starting with first line. I will give a comparative analysis between the five first line. That is H. R, Z, E, S. That is isoniazid, H. Ripamcin, R. Arizanamide, Z. Ethambutol, E. And streptomycin, S. So, we will be discussing them in the following headings. So, first I will tell you the introduction in each of them. Many important points comparative in the introduction. Mechanism of action of each of them. Resistance, the way they resist in each of them. Pharmacokinetics is in each of them. And adverse effects clearly. I will try to give you a mnemonic in each of them. There is no column uses. Why? Because all of them are anti-tubercular drugs. The use is TB only. The use is TB. These are anti-tubercular drugs. That's why I'm not giving you a column of uses. Of course, these are anti-tubercular drugs. So the only use is TB. But in some of them, apart from TB, other uses are also there. So I will mention in that column. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Shall I start the chapter? And after each of them, I will launch corresponding polls for that. Right? So we will be doing polls five times after each of them. And in the end, I will give you a mixture of the polls so that you can get confused. Can I start the chapter? Are you people there? Dr. Priya, wait for a while. When I will discuss in comparative analysis, I will let you know the side effects of each of them. So I am telling you side effects of each of them here. Right? So let me start the first one, isoniazid. Start filling this table with me. Start isoniazid. Start filling this table with me. Start the introduction. Write the introduction here in isoniazid. So in isoniazid, you can write, it is the single most important drug in the five drugs. HRZDS means sabse important here. The most important drug is isoniazid. It is bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic. See this table. HRZES. Never change the sequence. Right? Never change the sequence. It is always HRZES. In the sequence only, I will tell you everything. So never change the sequence. Right? HRZES, all of them are sidal except ethambutol which is static. Otherwise, all of them are sidal. So they all kill bacteria. Except ethambutol, which do not kill the bacteria. It is inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. Which bacteria? I'm talking about the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Give me a thumbs up. So that is about the sidal. So as I have told you, all of them are sidal. So this is also sidal. Isoniazid is also sidal. Right. Now let me draw the diagram of a lung. This is lung. It is causing tuberculosis in the lung now. So it produces granulomas in the lung. So these are the lung cells. These are the cells of the lung. These are the cells. Where is Mycobacterium tuberculosis present? So Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a rod-shaped bacteria. It is a acid fast positive rod-shaped red color rods are there. So it is present inside the cells of the lung producing granulomas there. It is also present outside the cell. So basically I mean to say it is present intracellular also, extracellular also. Right. So whenever I am giving the drug isoniazid, which of them is killed? Intracellular will be killed or extracellular or both? That is my question. You got my point? So isoniazid kills which bacteria? Intracellular or extracellular or both? So once of all, see this table. Once of all. So isoniazid kill both. 
Entra also, extra also. It is very strong drug. Rifampicin also kill both. Entra also, extra also. But pyrazinamide kills only intra. Streptomycin kills only extra, and ethambutol also kills both. So both me three drugs hain. H R or E. They kill both. By both I mean intracellular as well as extracellular. Pyrazinamide kills only intra, and streptomycin kills only extra. I would like to draw the lung diagram again to give you a clear concept once for all. So let me draw the lung diagram or any lymph node diagram or any organ in which tuberculosis is taking place. So these are the cells, right? So you can see bacteria is present intracellular also, and it is present extracellular also, right? So which drug I am telling you? I am telling you the three drugs H, R, and E. It kills intra also, extra also. They kills intra also, extra also, right? The next I am telling you only intra is Z. Only intra is Z. And only extra is streptomycin. Am I right? Am I right? If I am right, give me a thumbs up. So these all are your MCQs you are preparing, right? I will show you the MCQs also. So right, it is bacteriocidal. It is intra as well as extra. In the in the introduction only you have to write this, right? Now it acts on rapidly dividing bacilli, right? There are three type of bacteria present. Some are very rapidly dividing. Some are intermediate dividing. Some are slow dividing. So mostly rapid dividing is killed by the isoniazid. Right, it is more active against rapidly dividing. Right, it is the drug of choice for the treatment of TB. It is the drug of choice for prophylaxis of TB. Right, if someone is having TB, I will give isoniazid. I will give many drugs to treat a combination. Right, so there is a dose regimen. I will give the complete regimen, but drug of choice is isoniazid. Drug of choice is only one. That is isoniazid for the treatment of TB. Right, for the prophylaxis, just suppose, just suppose the mother. Uh, just after delivery, the mother got the diagnosis as tuberculosis, and she is breastfeeding the baby. So baby is at high risk, right? Baby is at high risk, so we have to give prophylaxis to the baby. Breastfeeding mother is tuberculosis, so we cannot separate the mother and baby for the six months. Breastfeeding is very important, and um, patient is having treatment for at least six months. So we cannot separate mother and baby for six months. So we will give prophylaxis to the baby, the feeding baby. So drug of choice of prophylaxis is also isoniazid. I will tell you the doses, right? So drug of choice hobia treatment ke liye bhi prophylaxis ke liye bhi. Ye bhi aapko introduction mein likhna hai. And the next is it is the drug. It is the drug which converts the patient from infectious to non-infectious earliest. Mark the word earliest. So this is a patient. He is coming. He is a male, forty year male. He is coming to my clinic, complaining doctor. I am having cough since last one month. I am having cough. Right, I am having cough and it is not getting treated with normal antibiotics. I have taken two courses and that's all. So I am having suspicion and he is complaining. Number one, I am having cough. Number one, I am having weight loss since last few months. I have I have lost two three kg of weight. Right, and I am having evening rise of fever, mild fever, evening fever. So these all indicate the patient is having TB. Maybe a young patient. So I will I will ask the patient to do a sputum analysis. Sputum test. So sputum test. The diagnosis is confirmed. He is a known case of TB. He is a known case of TB. And on PCR also we can confirm he is a known case of TB. The diagnosis is confirmed. So I will start the treatment. In the treatment there is a DOTS regimen. I will explain you everything. What is DOTS regimen? So depending on the category of the patient, there are two categories in DOTS. Cat one, cat two. I will start the treatment. In cat one also I will give many drugs. Isoniazid is one of them. In cat two also I will give many drugs. Isoniazid is one of them. So which drug? No, my, what is my main purpose? This patient is already infected. The patient is infected. Uh, it is a known case of TB. He is already having TB. But by a coughing, he is spreading the droplets everywhere, and the droplets are infecting other persons in the community. So I am currently afraid for the other persons, the surrounding people, the nearby people. They will also get infected from this person. So first aim is to convert him non-infectious. I want to cure him. There is a difference. Difference between converting the patient into non-infectious and curing the patient. Curing by cure, I mean all the bacteria are dead. By non-infectious, I mean only the cough may bacteria not. There is no bacteria in the droplet in the cough. Rather, some bacteria may be present inside the body. So first, I want to make him non-infectious, and gradually I want to cure him. So first, I want to make the sputum negative. Make the sputum negative, the cough negative, the droplet negative, so that at least he stop infection, uh, infecting others. After that, whatever residual bacteria are remaining inside the body, that I will, I will kill, I will uh, remove gradually, right? So it is the drug isoniazid is the drug which converts the patient from infectious to non-infectious earliest. Within two months, the patient will be non-infectious, but treatment will last for six months. So for the next four months, we will provide cure. You got my point. You got my point. Everyone, give me a thumbs up if you got my point. 
so that is the thing so it is a drug which which convert the patient non infectious earliest so that is about the introduction so tell me all the important points about the introduction i'm teaching you isoniazid tell me all the points so it is drug of choice for treatment it is drug of choice for prophylaxis treatment also prophylaxis also it is bactericidal all of them are bactericidal except ethambutol which is bacteriostatic so this is also bactericidal after that it is intracellular bacteria also it is extracellular bacteria also right and it is the earliest drug which convert patient from infectious to non infectious and basically it acts on fast acting rapidly dividing bacteria rapidly dividing bacteria are more sensitive for rhizomyosis that is the introduction everyone give me a thumbs up have you got it do you have any doubt in that so please learn all these points drug of choice for treatment isoniazid drug of choice for prophylaxis isoniazid the drug which convert patient from infectious to non infectious earliest again i'm not saying most potent this is not most potent most potent is rifampicin but earliest is it um, isoniazid so the words should be picked here is earliest earliest is isoniazid it acts on rapidly dividing bacteria it is bactericidal and it kills intracellular as well as extracellular both bacteria that is the summary of the introduction write all these points in the introduction let's come on mechanism of action let's come on mechanism of action in the mechanism of action see this diagram i have already taught you this diagram uh, you tell me how the cell wall of the bacteria is made up of so this is a bacteria the this is the nucleus of the bacteria and this is the cell wall of the bacteria can you see the cell wall the name of the bacteria is mycobacterium tuberculosis this is the drug isoniazid everyone see here this is the drug isoniazid so i have taken the pay i have asked the patient to take this drug to take the tablet of isoniazid because the patient is a known case the diagnosed case of tb so patient is taking isoniazid by mouth the tablet so it will go inside it will get absorbed it will reach in the blood from the blood it is going to the bacteria so this is how isoniazid enters inside the bacteria it will go inside the bacteria and this isoniazid i will tell you exactly how it inhibits cell wall synthesis in the bacteria the cell wall synthesis will be inhibited so that bacteria will be killed the bacteria it is bactericidal it will kill the bacteria by inhibiting cell wall synthesis how the answer of how is in front of you for the synthesis of cell wall in the bacteria bacteria require two things number one mycolic acid and number number two arabinoglycoside for the synthesis of mycolic acid two enzymes are required fast one and fast two without which mycolic acid is not synthesized so basically uh, isoniazid inhibits fast two not directly indirectly i will tell you how it inhibit fast 2 so fast 2 is non functional so mycolic acid will not form so cell wall is not formed so bacteria will die you got my point so this is the simple explanation of mechanism of action now let me complicate it let me complicate it isoniazid is a pro drug after entering inside the bacteria there is an gene inside the bacteria known as catg gene that catg gene will form an enzyme known as catalase peroxidase i will draw the diagram and that will that will convert the pro drug into active drug so isoniazid will get activated in the cytoplasm of the bacteria after getting activated it will go in the nucleus of the bacteria and inhibit a gene known as inh a gene if inh a gene is inhibited it will not form ketu vinyl reductase which is a carrier of fast 2 so fast 2 will not function mycolic acid will not form cell wall will not form bacteria will die shall i draw the diagram shall i draw the diagram everyone see so this is the cell wall of the bacteria right this is the cell membrane right and this is the nucleus and this is the dna right i want to kill this bacteria so that's why i have given isoniazid isoniazid enters inside the bacteria in the cytoplasm this is a pro drug this is inactive first i have to convert this pro drug into active active metabolite how it will be converted now there are genes present in the uh present in the dna present in the uh, nucleic acid or dna of the bacteria the first gene is cat g gene cat g gene will form an enzyme the name of the enzyme is catalase reductase this catalase reductase convert proactive drug into active drug now it is active now after becoming active it will go in the nucleus and inhibit another gene the name of the gene is inh a gene inh a gene is inhibited by the isoniazid isoniazid inhibit inh a gene what does inh ag gene do if it is not inhibited what does it do what is the normal function of inh ag inh ag gene will form a enzyme that is a carrier for fast 2 that is a carrier for fast 2 so now inh ag gene is not functional so fast 2 carrier will be not formed so fast 2 will not function 
FOMS2 is required for mycolic acid synthesis of the cell wall. So mycolic acid is not formed, so cell wall is not formed. Give me a thumbs up. So two genes are required. CAT-G, which is required for the activation of uh, isoniazid. And INHA is the main gene which is inhibited by the isoniazid. Everyone give me a thumbs up. I tried hard. So that is the mechanism of action written in front of you. Mechanism of action of isoniazid. So basically, it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis in the cell wall. Mycolic acid is not formed. Cell wall is not formed. Cell wall is not formed. The bacteria will be dead. So that is the mechanism of action. And why mycolic acid is not formed? Because FAS2 will not function. Why FAS2 will not function? You can see. This FAS2 will not function. That's why mycolic acid is, will not form. Why FAS2 will not function? Because the carrier for FAS2 is formed by an enzyme known as INHA. And that is inhibited by isoniazid. So isoniazid inhibits INHA gene. Which form a carrier for FAS2. Now INHA is inhibited, so no carrier form, so FAS2 will not function, mycolic acid will not form, cell wall will not form, bacteria will die. Give me a thumbs up, come on, Kishore, Deval, have you got it, Amar, Dr. Priya, Anju, have you got it, shall I proceed ahead? So that is the mechanism of action of isoniazid. Coming on resistance, how bacteria get the resistance? Now bacteria do not want to die, right? All bacteria want to live, no one likes death, right? So this is the bacteria. This is the nucleus of the bacteria and this is the cell wall of the bacteria. Now this bacteria is having two genes. As I have told you, CAT-G gene which is required for the activation of isoniazid from proactive form to active form. And the second gene is INHA gene. This is the main gene which is inhibited by isoniazid. So here is the isoniazid. I have given isoniazid. I want to kill this bacteria but bacteria do not want to get killed. So bacteria will do mutation either in this gene or in this gene. If the bacteria is doing mutation in CAT-G gene, so the enzyme that is catalyst reductase will not form and the prodrug will not convert into active drug. Since the prodrug will not convert into active drug, how it will act? So bacteria will not die and bacteria will survive. So bacteria ne pehla tarika kya socha? Bacteria ne socha CAT-G gene ko main mutate kar deta hon, inactivate kar deta hon. To chunki CAT-G gene work nahi karega, to catalyst reductase nahi banega. Catalyst reductase nahi banega, to prodrug active drug mein convert nahi hoga. Pro drug active drug may convert nahi hoga, so I will be alive, I will not be dead. Right, so that is the that is the planning of the bacteria that it is mutating the first gene, CAT G gene. You got my point. Now coming on the second gene, it will mutate INHA gene. It will do some changes in IH, INHA gene, not mutate exactly. It will do some changes in INHA gene so that the active drug, active drug cannot cause the damage to it, cannot cause mutation to it. So two types of mutation are possible. Mutation to CAT G gene and mutation to INHA gene. Both the genes can be mutated and there will be resistance for isoniazid, the main drug. You got my point? Coming on pharmacokinetics. This is the drug among the five drugs, HRZES. This is the drug which have maximum concentration in CSF. So blood-brain barrier do not stop it. It can cross blood-brain barrier. It can go to the CSF and maximum. So it is useful in meningeal TB, brain TB, meningeal TB. So in brain TB and meningeal TB, I want such drug which can penetrate BBB and can penetrate in the CSF. So isoniazid can penetrate to the CSF and maximum concentration in the CSF. Number one, the most important point. Number two, one more important point. Uh, this drug is metabolized by acetylation. This drug is metabolized. You should know all the drugs which are metabolized by acetylation. Today, if you have attended all my lectures, you may be knowing I have told you one more drug which is metabolized by acetylation. So you should know all the drugs which are metabolized by acetylation. It is very important. The mnemonic is CHIPS. The mnemonic is CHIPS. C stands for clonazepam. H stands for hydralazine. I for isoniazid, which is my chapter right now. P is pro, uh, propanamide. Another P is PABA. PABA, that is sulfon, PABA and sulfon, and S is sulfonamide. So in sulfonamide, I have told you, if you have attended my first lecture, the side effects of sulfonamide, I have told you ABC rash. ABC rash ka jo A hai na acetylation bolti hu, if you remember. So correlate that. So acetylation ka list ye hai, always remember. Chips. Chips pe bohot questions aate hai. So these all drugs are metabolized by acetylation. Isoniazid is one of them. Sulfonamides are one of them. Give me a thumbs up. So that is prokinetics. So pro, uh, that is pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics mein only two things are important. Isoniazid have maximum concentration in the CSF and it is metabolized by acetylation. These two things are important here. Coming on adverse effect, the last thing, adverse effect. There are four adverse effects. Allergy, sub me hota, I don't learn it. Every drug has uh, allergy as a side effect, allergy or hypersensitivity. The main, the main side effects are these three. These three are the main side effects. See, hepatitis means liver damage. 
Who causes liver damage? See this flow chart. Just a second. I want to tell you. Okay, I am not finding it. I will write it. H R Z E S. These are the five drugs I am going to teach you now. So liver damage. That is hepatitis is caused by this also, by this also, by this also. So see, it is causing minimum hepatitis. It is causing intermediate. It is causing very severe hepatitis. Hepatitis is caused by first three, not the next two. Next two do not cause hepatitis. So it causes hepatitis. The first three causes hepatitis. So it also causes hepatitis, right? Next, it causes peripheral neuritis. It causes neuropathy, the neuritis, the peripheral neuritis. The reason for peripheral neuritis, nerves require vitamin B6. Without vitamin B6, nerves, the axon of the nerves do not function. Nerves require vitamin B6, that is pyridoxin. Pyridoxin is vitamin B6. And isoniazid inhibit the pyridoxin, inhibit the absorption of pyridoxin, vitamin B6. So in case, if you are giving uh, isoniazid, Pyridoxin deficiency will occur. And because of pyridoxin deficiency, patient have neuritis. You go, there is no problem in the transmission. Please mind it. So peripheral neuritis will occur due to interference with pyridoxin metabolism. That is vitamin B6 metabolism. So patient can have neuropathy because of that. Hepatitis is reversible. Yeah. And hemolysis and G6PD deficiency. That's it. So these are the three side effects along with energy. Now who will tell me the answers of all? Who will tell me the answers? So H I am writing here. Huh? This is not H. This is R. So please fill the column. Tell me the introduction. Tell me the mechanism of action. Tell me the ways of resistance. Tell me pharmacokinetics. Tell me adverse effect. Who will fill this table with me? Anyone? Help me here, please. Introduction, me write down all the important points. Write down. Okay, I will write here. Intro, mechanism of action, resistance, pharmacokinetics, adverse effect. So write down like this. So please, we will revise first. Intro, then mechanism of action, then pharmacokinetics, resistance, and then adverse effect. We will fill it. In the intro, write down, it is the most important drug among the five. Uh, it is the drug of choice for treatment also. It is drug of choice for prophylaxis also. It is the drug which converts the patient from infectious to non-infectious earliest. It is the drug which is bacteriocidal. It is the drug which acts against intracellular as well as extracellular bacteria. It is the drug which acts against rapidly dividing bacteria. Have I missed any point? So these are all our important points in introduction. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Have you got it? Samin, Nitesh, Diana, Deval, Kishore. Have you got it? Amar, shall I proceed ahead? Coming on mechanism of action. Mechanism of action, it inhibits cell wall synthesis in the bacteria. Cell wall is made up of two things, mycolic acid and arabinogalactan. So it inhibits mycolic acid. Mycolic acid of the cell wall is not formed. That's why cell wall is not formed. Why mycolic acid is not formed? For the formation of mycolic acid, two enzymes are required, FAS1 fast and FAS2. So it inhibits FAS2. It inhibits FAS2. FAS2 is not active. Why FAS2 is not active? Because the carrier for, for FAS2 is made by an enzyme INHA. So that is the main action. Isoniazid inhibit INHA. So the carrier for FAS2 will not form. So FAS2 will not function. So mycolic acid will not form. So cell wall will not form and bacteria will die. Give me a thumbs up. You know the flowchart I have already told, taught you. Pharmacokinetics, only two points are important. It is metabolized by acetylation and it is having maximum concentration in CSF. Give me a thumbs up. Come on. Have you got it? Shall I proceed? Two ways of resistance. Who will tell me two ways of resistance? The two genes which are mutated. The first gene is CATG gene, which is mutated. The second gene is INHA, INHA gene, which is mutated. Who will tell me adverse effect? Apart from allergy, allergy to sabme hota hai, hypersensitivity. Tell me three other specific side effects. The most important is peripheral neuropathy, neuritis, neuritis, peripheral neuritis. It is due to interference with metabolism of vitamin B6, that is pyridoxin. So never give, it is a rule, never give isoniazid alone. Whenever you are giving isoniazid to your patient, always give it along with vitamin B6. Actually, in the market, the tablet of isoniazid is not available. The tablet always comes in combination with vitamin B6. If you give isoniazid alone, patient will have this uh, neuritis as a side effect. If you give the combination, patient will not have neuritis. To avoid neuritis, always, it is a rule, always give uh, this, uh, this thing, that is uh, isoniazid with vitamin B6. You got my point? So that is neuritis, the reason. The next is hepatitis. Hepatitis is caused by first three. H, R, Z. Tino karate hepatitis. And the next is hemolysis and G6PD deficiency. You got it? Shall we do some questions? So we have filled it completely. We will do a comparative analysis between the five. We are done with the first chapter. I am covering five chapters now. We are done with the first chapter. Isoniazid.
is done by my site. Shall we do some polls? You know all important points, I guess. This is the first question in front of you. Tell me the name of the anti-tubercular drug which makes the patient non-infectious earliest. Which makes the patient non-infectious earliest. The word to be picked here is earliest. Earliest. Who will tell me the answer? So yes, Kishore, you are absolutely right. I guess everyone will be right. It's an easy question. So the answer is, of course, isoniazid, everyone knows, right? So isoniazid is the drug which convert the patient from infectious to non-infectious earliest. I'm changing the question. I am changing the question. Instead of the word earliest, I want to ask, tell me the name of the drug which is most potent, which is most potent for converting the patient into non-infectious non, um, to non-infectious. Basically, the drug which cure the patient. Mujhe non-infectious means I need the patient ke zero bacteria. Chahiye. The count is zero. Every bacteria is killed. Even in sputum, even inside, all the bacteria, which is the most potent. In that case, your answer will become B. So, rifampicin is slow. It is not early. It is very slow acting. But it is most potent. Haan, slow hai, lekin most potent hai. Ye fast hai. It is fast acting. It is earliest, but not very potent. You got my point? I guess you got my point. Yes. So, the, in that case, your answer will become rifampicin. Not D. It is rifampicin kishore. Yes, yes. So, you got my point? Shall we proceed to the next question? This is the next question in front of you. Tell me the most effective drug against extracellular. Extracellular. So most effective drug against intra as well as extra. The answer is isoniazid. Isoniazid is effective against both. And since it is the most active drug against TB, so answer will be isoniazid. Don't get confused. I have to extra pucha. And isoniazid is active against both. Against intra also, against extra also. The most effective is isoniazid. So instead of extra, if intra is also written, my answer is same. If both is written, my answer is same. So the word is not intra or extra. The word is most effective. The word to be picked in this question is most effective. So most effective drug against intra as well as extra as well as both. Answer will remain same. It is isoniazid. It is isoniazid. So shall I proceed ahead? You know the five drugs I guess. Again revising. H-R-Z-E-S. So among these H, R and E act again against both. Intracellular as well as extracellular. They act against both. Intra, extra, intra, extra, intra, extra. Among these three, H is most effective. Against intra also, extra also. Right. But Z acts against only uh, intra and S acts against only extra. Am I right? So you have to learn like this. So that the answer is A. Coming to the next, next question. Most common side effect of isoniazid. Most common side effect of isoniazid. Who will tell me? The four options are in front of you. Is it hepatitis? Is it optic uritis? Is it peripheral neuropathy? Is it thrombocytopenia? Chalo. Optic uritis to hota hi nahi hai. Thrombocytopenia to hota hi nahi hai. Two options maine hi hata diye. Mujhe batao A or C me se kya sahi hai? What is right? From A and C. Both happens by isoniazid. But the clinch in the question is most common. I'm asking most common. So which is more common according to you? Hepatitis is most common or peripheral neuropathy is most common? So, peripheral neuropathy is most common side effect. That's why we always, always, always give vitamin uh, B6, that is pyridoxine, along with isoniazid. We never give isoniazid alone. It is a rule. It is a rule. You never give isoniazid alone to your patient. Whenever you give, you will give along with vitamin B6. So, that is the reason the correct answer here is C. Amish, why too? Optic neuritis yaan kaun se aagya? Optic neuritis to ithambutol karayega. I will teach you ithambutol. Optic neuritis nahi hai answer. The answer is C. Yeah, there is a confusion between A and C because both can be occurred by isoniazid. But most common agar hai, to I will go with C. Is, does everyone agree with me? The correct answer here is C. Coming to the next question. Which of the following drug interferes with pyridoxine metabolism? Pyridoxine means vitamin B6 metabolism. You all know the answer. It's a very easy question. Which of the following drug interferes with vitamin B6 metabolism? Isoniazid, tetracycline, erythromycin or rifampicin? Of course, the answer is A. Everyone knows that. That's why it causes peripheral neuropathy. The reason is that only. And that's why it is always given along with vitamin B6 in combination. Yes, the correct answer here is A. We all know that. The next question. Prolonged treatment of isoniazid leads to deficiency of which vitamin? I guess pyridoxine is vitamin B6. Thymine is vitamin B1. Pantothenic acid is vitamin uh, B5. And niacin is B3. Maybe I have written wrong numbers, but yeah, all of them are B complex. All of them are B complex. What is their answer now? Isoniazid ka prolonged treatment leads to deficiency of which vitamin? I guess easy question. Everyone will be right. Yes, yes. You all are right. Amar, Amish, Nitesh, Kishore, everyone is right. The correct answer here is A. Yes, Valvi. The correct answer here is A. So that is vitamin B6. And that's why it leads to peripheral neuropathy. 
if you don't give the supplement along with isoniazid. So yes, everyone is right. So we are done with the first one, isoniazid. It's time to start the second chapter of Thompson. So please start filling this table here in the same headings, right? Start filling here. Start filling Rifamsen. Everyone, start filling Rifamsen. So, Rifamsen ke introduction me likho. It acts against. So, isoniazid was a drug. I have taught you first drug, isoniazid. And now I am teaching you Rifamsen. Isoniazid is active only against one bacteria, TB. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. But Rifamsen is broad spectrum. It is effective against many bacteria. So, there are other uses of Rifamsen also. Apart from anti-tubercular drug. Isoniazid ka ek use hai, only one use, ATT, anti-tubercular drug, that's it. Because it kills only one bacteria, mycobacterium tuberculosis, there is no action of isoniazid on other bacteria. But rifamsin is broad spectrum, that you have to mention in the introduction, right? It is active against streptococci, staphylococci, meningococci, H. influenzae, legionella, apart from mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium lipri. So, lipri ke treatment mein bhi batongi. My next chapter is um, anti-lipri drugs. So, I will teach you there also. Right, rifamsin is drug. There also it is used. So, there are other uses also. Shall I go ahead? It is also bactericidal. As I have told you, this table, always remember this table. Out of the five drugs, H, R, Z, E, S. Only E is static. Rest all are sidal. So, that's why this is also bactericidal. But it is active against intermediate and slow acting in contrast to uh, isoniazid which was active against rapidly dividing. It is active against slow dividing and intermediate dividing. There are three types of bacteria as I told you now. So it is active against intermediate and slow, not rapid. It is also active against both intra as well as extracellular. You can see here. Isoniazid also active against both intra plus extra and rifamsin also active against both intra plus extra. Am I right? Am I right? So that is the thing. Sidon hogya. Uh, type of bacteria ho gaya, intra extra ho gaya. it is the most potent drug among the anti-tubercular drug among the five drugs now listen there are five drugs h r z e s so h is the earliest drug which convert the patient non-infectious and most potent is rifamsin now there is a patient understand the meaning of earliest or most potent what is the meaning of that please understand see here what i mean let me draw the diagram of a human. He is a diagnosed case of TB. He is a newly diagnosed case of TB. He is a young male and he is diagnosed case of TB. So in TB, everyone knows one of the symptoms is cough. Patient have irresistible cough. In the cough, there are droplets in the air. And that is the way of spreading. That is the way of spreading, right? So in the droplets, the bacteria is present and the person via coughing, it is spreading the infection to other healthy humans or the close contact humans via this stuff, right? Now, this is the TB. I want ki agle ko na ho. Being a doctor, I want to give him two things. Being a doctor, I want to give him treatment and I want to provide profile access to the others also, right? That is also my responsibility. So, for providing profile access to the others, we have to convert sputum negative. We have to convert sputum negative of the bacteria. Now, these are the lungs of this patient. Let me draw the lungs, right? He is having pulmonary TB. So, the bacteria is present inside the lung also. The bacteria is present in the sputum also. My first priority, my first priority of the treatment is to make sputum negative of bacteria. Right. My second priority is complete negative in the body. Complete negative in the body. Later on. Wo baad mein bhi hoga to chalega. Lekin pehle sputum ko negative karo so that it, he become non-infectious and stop spreading the infection in the community. Right. So, here I require a drug which is earliest acting. And here I require a drug which is most potent and make the bacteria count zero in the body in the end. Give me a thumbs up. So the drug of choice for earliest action will be isoniazid, but the most potent, it is rifamsin. But this one is slow acting. Rifamsin is slow acting. You got my point? You got my point? Shall we proceed ahead? Shall we proceed ahead? What Amish you are asking? How long drugs start to make patient asymptomatic? Asymptomatic, Amish, what do you mean by asymptomatic? Uh, asymptomatic means you want complete treatment. So it depends on the category. I am coming on dots, Amish. First attend my complete lecture, then ask the same question to me if still you have doubt. I will teach you in dots for how much how, how much time we give the treatment and after how much time the patient will become asymptomatic. I will teach you that in dots. Let me finish that. So, so can I continue? So that is the most potent. That is the most potent. So that is the introduction. Let me compare the introduction of the two drugs. Right. I taught you isoniazid and currently I am teaching you rifamsin. Can we compare the introduction part of both of them? If you allow, both of them are bactericidal. Can I say? Yes. This one is the earliest which act and convert the patient non-infectious. 
This one is the most potent sterilizing agent. I am using the word sterilizing. What do you mean by sterilization? Sterilizing agent. Sterilization means bacteria count will become zero. Isoniazid is not sterilizing. It will only make cuff negative. Not the complete body negative of bacteria. But rifampicin will make complete body negative of bacteria. You are getting my point. So both of them are bactericidal. Can I say? But isoniazid is earliest and rifampicin is most potent sterilizing agent. Can I say? Both of them act on both bacteria. Intra, extra, intra, extra. Can I say? Can I say this? Um, isoniazid. Isoniazid act on rapidly dividing bacteria and rifampicin act on intermediate and slow dividing bacteria. Can I say this? Okay. Isoniazid is the drug of choice for treatment also, for prophylaxis also. Rifampicin is not a drug of choice. Everyone give me a thumbs up first. Everyone. That is the comparison of the introduction part of both of them. Likewise, you have to compare the introduction of all five. So, always say first side of the state. Pahle to ye batao. Uski baad some important points. Uski baad konsa bacteria. Uski baad intracellular, extracellular. In this sequence only you always write. So that is the introduction is done of the two drugs. Let me move to the mechanism of action of rifampicin. Rifampicin. So I taught you there are five drugs. H, R, Z, E, S. Don't change the sequence. Right? If you change the sequence, sabko shil jayega. Right? Don't change the sequence. Out of the five, three will act by inhibiting the cell wall of the bacteria. Isoniazid inhibit the cell wall of the bacteria. Pyrazinamide also inhibit the cell wall synthesis of the bacteria. Ethambutol also inhibit the cell wall synthesis of the bacteria. So these three act by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis in the bacteria. Rifampicin R for R. Rifampicin inhibit RNA synthesis in the bacteria. I will teach you how. So I, currently I am teaching you Rifampicin. So Rifampicin R for R. Learn like that. Rifampicin inhibit RNA synthesis in the bacteria. And streptomycin, the last one, streptomycin is the aminoglycoside. Just now, before this lecture, I taught you aminoglycoside, it is a protein synthesis inhibitor. So, it inhibits protein synthesis in the bacteria. Please see, everyone see. Give me a thumbs up. Let me draw a diagram of the bacteria. The name of the bacteria is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the cell membrane. This is the cell wall. This is the nucleus. The nucleus have DNA, right? This is DNA and this is the ribosome. And on the ribosome, this is the protein synthesis on the ribosome taking place, right? And from DNA, RNA can be formed from DNA here. From DNA, RNA can be formed. Now tell me the mechanism of the drugs in this diagram. So out of the five H, Z and E, they inhibit cell wall synthesis. Can I say this? Rifampicin inhibit RNA synthesis, R for R. And streptomycin inhibit protein synthesis by acting on the ribosome. Everyone give me a thumbs up. So this is the simplest way, the five mechanism of action I can tell you. Now I will tell you the details. Now I will tell you the details. What chapter is going What I am teaching currently? I am teaching you Rifampicin. Right now I am teaching you Rifampicin. Yes. So mechanism of action, it inhibits RNA. It inhibits RNA synthesis inside the bacteria. How? It inhibits an enzyme. The name of the enzyme, actually it inhibits a gene known as RPO, Repo, Repo B gene. Let me draw the diagram of bacteria again. This is the bacteria. This is the cell wall of the bacteria. This is the nucleus of the bacteria. This is the DNA of the bacteria. On the nucleus, inside the DNA, there is a gene known as RAPO-B gene. Right? Now, this bacteria is mycobacterium tuberculosis. I want to kill this bacteria. For killing, I am giving a drug rifampicin. Patient has taken a tablet of rifampicin. The rifampicin is absorbed going in the blood. From the blood, the rifampicin is entering inside the bacteria. It is not a pro-drug like isoniazid. Please compare. It is directly active drug. After going inside the bacteria, it will go to the nucleus and inhibit this gene. The name of the gene is RAPO-B gene. Now compare, in isoniazid, the name of the gene which was inhibited was INHA gene. Here the name of the gene which is inhibited is RAPO-B gene. So what does RAPO-B gene do normally? RAPO-B gene forms an enzyme. The name of the enzyme is DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. What is the name of the enzyme? It is DNA-dependent. Based on DNA, it, it synthesizes RNA. So DNA dependent RNA polymerase is the enzyme which convert DNA to RNA, DNA to RNA. So this enzyme is not formed because the gene for this enzyme is already mutated by rifampicin. Now this enzyme is not formed so DNA will not convert into RNA, RNA will not form the bacteria will die. Everyone give me a thumbs up, it's, it's very simple. So rifampicin inhibit a gene, the name of the gene is RAPO-B gene, draw diagram for everything. You will never forget once you have seen in the diagram. 
So imagine rifampicin is entering inside the cell. It is going to the nucleus. In the nucleus, it is going to the DNA. In the DNA, it is inhibiting a gene. The name of the gene is RAPO, RPO, RPO B gene. And this gene synthesizes a enzyme. The name of the enzyme is DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now please understand the name of the enzyme. DNA dependent है. और polymerase means synthesis. Synthesis RNA का कर रहा है. So it is DNA to RNA. Now don't do opposite. In the option you will get another enzyme RNA dependent DNA polymerase. No, it do not inhibit RNA dependent DNA polymerase. It inhibit DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So this enzyme is inhibited. So DNA to RNA conversion will not occur and RNA will not form and the bacteria will die. That's how it is bacteriocidal. Give me a thumbs up. Come on. Diana, you got it. Nitesh, Amish, have you got it? Kishore, can we go ahead? So what is the way of resistance? The next is resistance. So bacteria do not want to die now. So bacteria will do changes in the RAPO B gene so that it cannot be affected by the rifampicin. So here resistance is by RAPO B gene. Right. Pharmacokinetics. It has to be taken empty stomach. Rifampicin. So for better bioavailability because food decreases its bioavailability. Take empty stomach. Number one. Number two. It is excreted in bile. It is excreted in bile and shows antrohepatic circulation. Only two points are important. Coming on adverse effect. In the adverse effect, the yeah one more point in the... Uh, pharmacokinetics. It is an enzyme inducer. You know CYP enzymes are present in the liver. CYP450. So you should know the name of the uh, CYP450 inducers and you should know the list of the drugs which are CYP450 inhibitors. Where is rifampicin? Rifampicin is coming here. So it is an inducer of CYP450. So this is also an important point you can say along with uh, antrohepatic circulation. So only these two points are important. Antrohepatic circulation and enzyme inducer. These two points are important. Adverse effect. As I have told you, there are five drugs. H, R, Z, E, S. The first three causes hepatitis. The first three causes hepatitis. So, hepatitis is caused by this, this, this. But here it is mild. Here it is moderate. Here it is severe. These two do not cause hepatitis. So, hepatitis I taught you in isoniazid also. And currently I am teaching you hepatitis in rifampicin also. Right. So, hepatitis is there. Right. After that, blood dysphagias are there. Blood dysphagias are there and flu-like symptoms are there. This is allergy. Allergy to sub me over. Don't learn that. And flu-like symptoms. Right. There is one more adverse effect. The urine and all body situations convert red-orange. So, I don't have diagram. Imagine, there is a TB patient in front of you and you have started the dots. You have started the treatment. He's diagnosed TB and you have started dots. You have given the tablets in the dots. Dots contain rifampicin. Dots contain many tablets. One of them is rifampicin. So, you have given the rifampicin to the patient. Patient is going home. So, after going home, the urine of the patient is red. The tears of the patient become red. The saliva of the patient become red. All the secretions in the body become red. And patient got afraid. Patient think it is blood. No, it is not blood. It is a side effect of rifampicin. Rifampicin is secreted in body secretions. So, secretions are in the tears, in the eyes, it is in the form of the tears. In the nasal secretions, in the saliva, in the cervical secretions, in the urine, Everywhere, everything is red. All the body secretions will become red. So, always instruct the patient, your body secretions are going to be red. Your urine is going to be orange red. So, don't get afraid. It is a side effect of rifampicin. So, urine and all other secretion is going to be orange red. It is a, uh, no, it is safe in renal failure. Yes, Nitesh, it is not causing renal failure. It is the secretions converting red. The drug is red color. It is like a dye providing this uh, color to the secretions, right? So, that is thing. That is the thing. So, other uses of rifampicin. As I have told you, rifampicin is a drug which is active not only in tubercular bacteria but in other bacteria also. Streptomycin, streptococcus, streptococcus. Other bacteria also, it is active for other bacteria. So, it is active against leprosy also. It is given in prophylaxis of meningococca and H. influenzae also. It is a second line drug for MRSA. It is given in doxycycline combination in the brucellosis also. So, these are the other uses of rifampicin if you want to learn. I am done with chapter 2 also rifampicin. So, we will do a comparison of the two drugs and then we will move to the third drug. Right. Till now, we have studied two drugs, H and R. We will do a comparison between the two. So, tell me the introduction of both of them. Tell me the mechanism of action of both of them. Tell me the resistance of both of them, pharmacokinetics of both of them and adverse effect. Who will help me among you? So, in the, in the introduction, we have already done. Both are bacteriocidal, no problem. Both of them act against both intra-extra, intra-extra, cellular, right? Uh, as soon as it acts against rapidly dividing, but rifampicin acts again against intermediate and slow dividing, right? That is the difference. Isoniazid is drug of choice for treatment also, for prophylaxis also. Rifampicin is not a drug of choice. 
Isoniazid is the ugliest drug which makes the patient non-infectious. Rifamcin is the most potent drug. Right. Give me a thumbs up. Everyone give me a thumbs up. So that is the earliest and the most potent. Coming on mechanism of action. Mechanism of action. Isoniazid inhibits cell wall synthesis by inhibiting an enzyme known as INHA enzyme. Rifamcin inhibits RNA synthesis by inhibiting a gene known as RAPOB gene. So if you talk about the genes, here the name of the gene is INHA, here the name of the gene is RAPOB. It inhibits cell wall synthesis, it inhibits RNA synthesis. You know the exact mechanism, how does it do? What is the wave of resistance? What is the way of resistance? Here resistance is by two enzymes. CAT G, not enzyme, sorry, gene. It is CAT G gene and INHA gene. And in Rifamcin, the way of resistance is by inhibition or mutation of RAPOB gene. Right? Pharmacokinetics, kinetics may I taught you important points. In pharmacokinetics, what were the important points in isoniazid? It is metabolized by acetylation and maximum secretion in the CSF. In rifamcin, I taught you it is an enzyme inducer and it shows enterohepatic circulation and it is taken empty stomach. Adverse effect, both causes hepatitis. Hepatitis here also, here also, but here mild, here moderate, right? Apart from hepatitis, what were the side effects in isoniazid? I forgot. Can you help me? What were the side effects? In isoniazid, apart from hepatitis, or kya kya tha? Apart from hepatitis, yeah, peripheral neuritis was there and hemolysis in G6PD deficiency was there, right? In rifamcin, uh, peripheral neuritis is due to pyridoxine deficiency. That is vitamin B6 deficiency. That's why it is always given along with vitamin B6. Yes, thank you, Kishore. Thank you for reminding. Remind me the side effects of rifamcin now, Kishore. What are the side effects of rifamcin apart from hepatitis? Apart from hepatitis, the urine and secretions become red and orange. That is a side effect you can say. Blood dyscrasias are there and flu-like symptoms are there. Yes, Nagasri. Very good. So, apart from allergy, right? Allergy everywhere. Hypersensitivity and allergy is everywhere. Apart from it, what are the side effects like that? So, this is the comparative analysis of the first two. Shall we move ahead? Shall we move ahead? So, we will do some questions on rifamcin and move to the third drug now. That is parazinamide. So, some questions on rifamcin. Sub questions on, now the questions on uh, rifamcin. Read the first question. Tell me what is the answer. Maximum sterilization action is shown by which anti-TB drug? I'm, I'm asking sterilization action. What do you mean by steril sterilization? Sterilization means bacteria count becomes zero. That is known as sterilization, right? Right, so maximum sterilization is caused by which one? So yes, the answer here is, of course, it is rifamcin. And instead of maximum sterilization, if I ask the earliest, the answer becomes isoniazid. Now you all can get this point. So correct answer here is A. Yes, Kishore, Amar, Nagasri, absolutely right. The correct answer here is A. This is the next question. Can you tell me what is the correct answer here? Rifamcin X by. What is the mechanism of action of rifamcin? It acts by inhibiting which enzyme? Can you tell me the name of the enzyme? Can you tell me the name of the enzyme inhibited by rifamcin? So is it DNA dependent RNA polymerase or is it RNA dependent DNA polymerase? Is it mycolic acid inhibition or is it mycolic acid incorporation defects? What you will say? Yes, Nagasri, Kishore, yes, Amar, absolutely right. The correct answer here is DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Don't get confused with option B. RNA dependent DNA polymerase. Don't get confused with option B. It is that it is the drug which uh, inhibit enzyme DNA dependent RNA polymerase which convert DNA to RNA. So DNA to RNA conversion is uh, inhibited here. RNA will not form. R for rifamcin, R for RNA. Learn like that. R, R. Rifamcin is a drug which inhibit RNA synthesis. Right. So A is the answer. Okay. I am changing the question. Everyone here. Instead of rifamcin, if I say isoniazid. In the same question, isoniazid, what is your answer now from the same four options? What is your answer now from the same four options? Is it option A, B, C, D? What is true now? Out of the four options, what is true now? If I am saying isoniazid, what is your answer now? Diana, what is the answer? Nitish, yes, Nagasari. Yes, Amar, absolutely right. In that case, your answer will become mycolic acid synthesis inhibition by inhibiting the enzyme fast 2 the carrier of the fast 2 by inhibiting the gene INHA. Ab gene puche to answer INHA bolna hai. Enzyme puche to answer fast 2 bolna hai. Or actually mycolic acid synthesis inhibition bolna hai cell wall mein. In that case answer will become C. No not Nitish not B. It's, it's C. Right. 
So correct is uh, correct answer will become C in that case. So shall I move ahead? This is the next question in front of you. Which of the following is most active against both dormant and non-dormant bacillus? Dormant and non-dormant. But dormant and non-dormant, I mean slow and intermediate both acting. Dormant will be slow acting, right? Slow dividing. So answer will be rifamcin in this case. Coming on the next question. The most effective anti-tubercular drug against slow, slow multiplying bacteria. Slow and intermediately best is rifamcin. So correct answer here is A, right? I'm moving ahead. ATT which causes orange color urine. You all know that. ATT which causes orange or red color urine. Not only urine, all the secretions of the body will become red or orange. Of course, the answer is A. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. Very good. So, contact lens staining will occur by which ATT? Common sense. Contact lens. So, someone is having a contact lens in the eye. Someone use contact lens in the eye. And he is diagnosed as ATT. And you offered dots. In the dots, rifamcin is there. So, rifamcin causes red tears. The tears in the eye become red in color. And if someone is using contact lens, the contact lens will get stained. So, always you have to instruct the patient, don't use contact lens via, while you are on ATT, while you are on rifamcin. So, don't use that. Otherwise, it will get stained. Use spectacles. Use spectacles. So, correct answer here is B and you all are right. You got my point. So, correct answer here is B. Shall I move ahead? Okay, we will leave this. So, we are done with isoniazid. We are done with rifamcin. I am coming on the third drug, pyrazinamide. Shall I start pyrazinamide? Are you people with me? Shall we continue pyrazinamide in the same headings? Okay. Starting with introduction. It is a weak drug. It is also siddle. You can see this is siddle, this is siddle, this is siddle. But you can say this is weak siddle. It is weak siddle. It is weak siddle. Number one. Right. The first thing, it is weak siddle. Okay, right, okay. It acts only against intracellular organism, not extra. You can see here, isoniazid acts against both, rifamcin acts against both, but it acts only against intracellular, not extracellular. Am I right? Am I right? So, it acts only against intracellular, not extracellular. Shall we continue? It is effective only against intracellular, not intracellular that I have already taught you. Okay. Coming on directly mechanism of action. So, in the introduction, only siddle and intracellular, these two points are important, nothing else. So, we can see here, we can compare here. Coming on mechanism of action. In the mechanism of action, you can see here. Isoniazid was the drug which, which was inhibiting FAST2. Pyrazinamide is a drug which will inhibit FAST1. Ultimately, FAST1, FAST2, whatever is inhibited, mycolic acid will not form. If mycolic acid is not formed, cell wall will not form. Cell wall will not form, bacteria will die. Give me a thumbs up. So, pyrazinamide inhibit fast 2 by inhibiting, a, by inhibiting a gene. You have to tell me the name of the gene. The name of the gene is PNCA. P -N -C -A, P -N -C -A gene. So, let me draw again the same diagram. You got it what I am going to draw. So, this is the bacteria. This is the cell wall of the bacteria. This is the nucleus of the bacteria. Inside the nucleus, there is a DNA. Right. Now, you will draw the gene. The name of the gene is PNCA. P -N -C -A, P -N -C -A gene. Now, I want to kill this bacteria. The name of this bacteria is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is present in my patient's body causing tuberculosis. Being a doctor, I want to give the patient a drug which kills this bacteria, right? So, I offered pyrazinamide to this patient in the form of the dots, right? So, pyrazinamide is going inside the body. Patient is taking the tablet. It is getting absorbed. It is going in the body from the blood. It is going to the bacteria. It enters inside the bacteria. It enters inside the bacteria. It goes in the nucleus of the bacteria. Inhibit the gene PMK. Inhibit the gene Pianca. What does this Pianca do? Pianca form an enzyme. The name of the enzyme is FAST1 enzyme. So, FAST1 will non-functional now. Right. FAST1 is required for synthesis of mycolic acid of the cell wall. So, mycolic acid will not form. Mycolic acid is required for cell wall. So, cell wall will not form. So, bacteria will die. That is how it is the cell action. Everyone give me a thumbs up. You got the story. Pyrazinamide inhibit Pianca gene. That's why inhibit the activity of FAST1. That's why inhibit the formation of mycolic acid. That's why inhibit the formation of cell wall. And that's why still the same story is written in front of you. Right? So, shall we continue? Yes? So, Diana, thank you very much for your feedback. And stay connected for more amazing things. So, you can see here, uh, pyrazinamide inhibit PMK gene. So, FAST1 is not formed. Right? So, it inhibits the FAST1. So, mycolic acid is not formed. Right? So, cell wall is not formed. And the bacteria will die. So, it's very simple. Resistance is by PMK gene. So, bacteria do not want to die. So, bacteria will do some mutations in the PNK gene so that pyrazinamide cannot come and inhibit it. Right? So, PNK gene is the way of mutation, is the way of resistance. 
pharmacokinetics only one thing is important like isoniazid it also comes in csf but maximum csf concentration is of isoniazid only the first one it also comes in csf and we can give this also in meningeal tb in meningeal tb or brain tb i want to give such drug which can penetrate csf so out of the five two can penetrate isoniazid can penetrate and pyrazinamide can also penetrate so pharmacokinetics only this point is important coming on adverse effect as i have told you first three drugs again and again i am telling the same point h r z e s never change the sequence again i am requesting the same thing among these the first three are hepatotoxic this causes hepatitis 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 this is mild this is moderate this is severe yes or no yes or no so yes so it is causing hepatitis and it is the most hepatotoxic among the first three number 1 number 1 number 2 it causes hyperuricemia it decreases the urea excretion from the kidney so it causes hyperuricemia hyperuricemia that will lead to gout that will lead to gout you got my point that will lead to gout so because of the gout patient will have arthralgia the joint pain so that is the two side effects that is the two side effects okay i would like to write it once more i want to tell you something h r z e s what i have told you where is hepatitis hepatitis kahan kahan par hai hepatitis side effect is present where in the first three ab tak to sabko yaad ho gaya hoga in the first three here mild here moderate here severe right now i am telling you gout hyperuricemia or gout the second side effect so hyperuricemia or gout one and the same thing it is present in the third and fourth hyperuricemia and gout is present in the third and fourth so pyrazinamide and ethambutol both have hyperuricemia and gout so these are the two side effects of pyrazinamide one of them that is hepatitis is common with these two and one of them that is gout is common with the ethambutol the next one which i will teach you so this is having only two side effects right apart from it you have to write others here others here others here you have to fill the column right give me a thumbs up so this is the easy way i can make it out so okay we have seen adverse effect one is hepatitis and one is gout these two are there that's it that is the adverse effect so after the adverse effect you want the comparison or shall i directly launch the poll you want the comparison in the end we will do the comparison now i'm launching the polls based on pyrazinamide and moving to the next drug ethambutol so that we can complete the syllabus and we in the end we will do a master table a master comparison between all so let's do some questions on pyrazinamide the first question is in front of you which one of the following att precipitate gout i told you gout is done by two the third and the fourth that is z and e both will cause gout but in the option which is present in the option whatever is present that will be my answer in the option i can find only pyrazinamide yes so i can find only pyrazinamide in the options so i will go with a i will go with a give me a thumbs up are you people watching why you are not writing the answer yes amar absolutely right yes nagasri so correct answer here is a right if ethambutol is also given in the option my answer was that also but here it is not given it is not given if i am changing the question and i am asking instead of gout hepatitis which is which of the drug uh, causing hepatitis which of the following drug causing hepatitis so three answers will be there h r and z a b d streptomycin don't cause except streptomycin rest all three causes right so you have to attempt the question reading it properly so this is the next question maximum liver toxicity is seen in which liver toxicity is caused by first three h r z tino karate hain all three causes liver toxicity but the question is maximum who causes maximum who causes maximum sabse zyada kon karega who will cause maximum so as i have told you hepatitis is caused by first second and third here it is mild here it is moderate here it is most severe right so the correct answer here is c am i right am i right right uh paracetamide is weak sidel yes you are right i can't read your name but yeah you, you are right paracetamide is weak sidel it causes no there is no correlation between the two i guess you are getting confused sidel means it is having weak sidel activity for killing the bacteria that is something else but it causes maximum hepatitis that is a side effect that is a side effect hepatitis is not due to bacteria killing uh, activity i guess i guess you got your answer the two things are separate but the two things are correct it is a weak sidel it is also correct and it is it is it is causing most severe hepatitis that is also correct hepatitis is a side effect and weak sidel is, is its action so correct answer here is c shall i move ahead so this is the next question not next question moving to the fourth drug ethambutol moving to the fourth ethambutol it's time to write ethambutol to complete the table ethambutol write down only ethambutol is take rest all are sidel 
So that is the hallmark. That is the most important feature of ethambutol. It is static. It is not settled. It is not settled. It also acts against fast multiplying like isoniazid. Like isoniazid. So this one against fast. I will give you the table in the end. So it also acts against fast acting. And it is the least toxic among all drugs. Among all five, this one is the least toxic. Ethambutol is least toxic. Least toxic. That is the important points in the beginning. Coming on mechanism of action. Coming on mechanism of action of ethambutol. You tell me what does ethambutol do? See the diagram. You yourself will understand. What does it do? Uh, what does isoniazid do? Isoniazid inhibits fast 2 enzyme. You can see. So mycolic acid will not form. So cell wall will not form. What does pyrazinamide do? Pyrazinamide inhibits fast 1 enzyme. So that mycolic acid is not formed. Cell wall is not formed. Right. You know the name of exact genes which are mutated. Isoniazid inhibit INHA gene for, for inhibiting FAST2 enzyme. And pyrazinamide inhibit PIMCA gene for inhibiting FAST1 enzyme. These drugs are not inhibiting enzymes. These drugs are inhibiting the genes which form these enzymes. So isoniazid inhibit INHA gene which form FAST2 enzyme. And pyrazinamide inhibit PIMCA gene which form FAST1 enzyme. So ultimately FAST1, FAST2 will not form. Mycolic acid is not formed. And cell wall will not form. But what about ethambutol? Ethambutol inhibit arabinocyl transferase enzyme. By inhibiting a gene, the name of the gene is EMB, EMB AB gene. So there is a gene, EMB AB gene, which codes for this enzyme. That gene is inhibited. So this enzyme will be uh, inhibited. So arabinogalactine will not form. So ultimately, my cell wall is not formed. So ultimately cell wall nahi banega. Lekin kyun nahi banega? Because this time mycolic acid to banega. Mycolic acid will form. But arabinogalactone will not form. Why it is not formed? Because the enzyme required for this formation is, is not formed. Because the gene for that is inhibited. You got my point? So the name of the gene is EMB AB gene. Let me draw the diagram of the bacteria as usual. So this is the bacteria. This is the cell wall of the bacteria. This is the nucleus of the bacteria. This is the DNA of the bacteria. This bacteria is mycobacterium tuberculosis. And there is a gene on this bacteria. The name of the gene is EMB AB gene. Right. I want to, I am giving a drug that is ethambutol in the treatment of the tuberculosis. This ethambutol is entering inside the bacteria. After entering, it is inhibiting this gene. This gene codes for a protein. The name of the protein or name of enzyme is arabinocyl galactase. So this enzyme will not function. So arabinogalactoside will not form. So cell wall will not form. And this gives the static action. The bacteriostatic action of ethambutol. It cannot divide. Give me a thumbs up. Yes, it is only static, not subtle. So this is the complete story. You got it. So it inhibits EMB ABG. So that arabinogalactase enzyme is not formed. Arabinogalactan will not form. And cell wall will not form. Here mycolic acid will form. But arabinogalactan. Ultimately, ye nahi So some of the drugs inhibiting mycolic acid synthesis. Some of the drugs inhibiting, inhibiting arabinogalactan synthesis. Ultimately, cell wall synthesis in vitro. So there are three drugs out of the five which inhibit cell wall. Which inhibit cell wall. Right. So we are done with ethambutol mechanism. Resistance, you got it. The name of the gene. It is mutated. Right. Pharmacopanetics. It is not hepatotoxic. This drug is the first three are hepatotoxic. Right. H R Z E S. I told you first three are hepatotoxic. Have I told you? So this is hepatotoxic, hepatotoxic, hepatotoxic. Mild, moderate, severe. Ethambutol is not hepatotoxic, but it is renal, renotoxic. Right? It is renotoxic. That is, it causes toxicity to the kidney. So right, kidney toxic. It is kidney toxic. And one is common in third and fourth is hyperuricemia. So let me write hyperuricemia here and here. So you can see the first three are hepatotoxic. The fourth one is kidney toxic. And third and fourth are causing gout. So that is how these are the common one. Right? And apart from it, Specific side effects are there. So it is renotoxic. It is excreted by the kidney and it accumulates in the kidney. It accumulates in the kidney and renal failure. In pharmacokinetics, you can say that. Side effects. The most important side effect here is optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is color blindness. You know what you mean by optic neuritis? Itis means inflammation. In pathology, itis is inflammation. Itis is inflammation. So it is the inflammation of the optic nerve. Where is optic nerve? So you must have eyeball. Just behind the eyeball, there is optic nerve, right? So these are the eyeballs. Just behind the eyeball, there is optic nerve, which is going to the brain. You know that, right? So that is optic nerve. This is optic nerve. So this optic nerve get inflamed. When the optic nerve due to ethambutol. So patients have color blindness. What is color blindness? Patients have everything green. 
everything looks like green, right? Patient cannot differentiate red and green and it produces green vision in the patient. So that is color blindness or optic neuritis. It is also known as retrobulbar neuritis because the bulbs are the eyeball and it is behind the eyeball. That is retrobulbar neuritis. That is the location of the optic neuritis. But this is reversible. As soon as the patient complain everything is green, stop the treatment with ethambutol. Ethambutol stop the drug. Once you stop the drug, in the next few days, it will be reversed. So it is reversible if detected early. But if you continue with thumbutol, continue with thumbutol, even after green vision, so it will cause permanent um, damage to the optic nerve and then it will be irreversible. That's why thumbutol is not given in children because children sometimes they cannot speak, right? They are small children and they cannot report something is good. I, I can see everything is green. So they cannot complain that. So we cannot take the chance. We cannot take the risk, right? So thumbutol is not given in children because of this reason. And periodic test of the visual equity and color discrimination is given in patient, done in patient, who are on ethambutol. So most important side effect is optic neuritis, color blindness. Apart from it, I have already taught you gout. Gout is a common feature of third and fourth, that is parazinamide and ethambutol. I have already taught you. So these are the two important side effects. Apart from it, allergy to hota hiya sabme, not important. So allergy to sabi mein. Right, we are done with ethambutol also. Shall I move to the fifth and the last one? Shall I move to the fifth and the last one? Right. Uh, I am not sure, Kishore, about your answer. You are asking whether they are able to differentiate blue and red, so I am not sure. In the books, it is written, they are not uh, differentiating red from green and the vision is basically predominantly green. So, I will search for your answer. If I find anything, I will reply on the telegram. But I am really not sure and I do not want to bluff. Right. So, I am not sure about this answer. So, coming on the last drug, that is streptomycin. Streptomycin. So, before that, there are a few polls of ethamutol. So, okay. This is the first question. Please participate in the poll. All of the following are bacteriocidal except one of them is not sidal. Tell me that. Which of them is not sidal? Can you tell me the answer? Is it isoniazid? Is it rifampicin? Is it thumbutol? Is it pyrazinamide? Which of them is not sidal? That is which of them is static? Of course, static is only one. Yes, ethambutol. Absolutely right. The correct answer here is C. Absolutely right. So ethambutol is the correct answer. Right. Optic neuritis is caused by. Currently, the question is very easy. I guess everyone knows the answer. So optic neuritis is caused by. Yes, what is the correct answer? Of course, ethambutol. Right? We know that. But once you do the question, now the thing will fit in your permanent memory. You will say, ma'am, why you are giving such easy questions to us? Right? Once I will teach you the complete pharmacology, the same question when I will give you, now you will get confused. So correct answer here is A. Everyone knows it. Why ethambutol is avoided in children? Why it is avoided in children? Because it causes dental maldevelopment. Because it causes visual disturbances. Because, because it causes renal failure. Or because it causes growth retardation. What do you think? Why thumbutol is avoided in children? What do you think? Amar, Vivek, what do you think? Naga, Sri, Ishore, why thumbutol is avoided in children? Can you see? Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. The correct answer here is B. Yes, yes. Correct answer because of visual disturbances. A patient can't report, the child cannot report the green vision or optic neuritis or visual dis disturbances. Not B and C both. Answer is only B. Renal failure, ki, renal failure is also caused by thumbutol. I am not saying no. But in children, it is not avoided because of this reason. In children, it is avoided because of visual disturbances. Right? So, answer is not A, not C. Answer is B. No, Diana. Answer is not A. Not because of dental maldevelopment. I have not mentioned any dental maldevelopment thing here. Dental maldevelopment is caused by tetracycline. Tetracycline is also avoided in children. The reason is dental, uh, you know, uh, it, it functions with the dent, uh, with um, teeth. So that is tetracycline. Here the answer is B. You got it? The answer is B. So sure, B and C both is caused by ethambutol. But the question is not that ethambutol causes what? The question is that ethambutol is avoided in children. Why? So in children it is avoided because of visual disturbances, not because of renal failure. So answer is B. Yes, Diana, answer is B. You got it? So correct answer is B. So this is the next question in front of you. Which of the following is not a hepatotoxic drug? Not. So, first three are hepatotoxic. I always teach again and again. So, H, R and Z are hepatotoxic. But E is renotoxic, kidney toxic, not hepatotoxic. So, correct answer here is A. I guess everyone knows it. Done. Can you see my screen? Yes, Amar. Absolutely right. Why you are not writing the answers? Yes, absolutely right. The correct answer here is A. The first three are hepatotoxic, not the fourth and the fifth one. Yes, correct answer here is A. So, we are done with four. H, R, Z, E. The last one, streptomycin. The last one, streptomycin. By the way, streptomycin is injectable. These four were oral. Streptomycin don't come in the form of the tablet. Streptomycin comes in the form of the injection. 
So starting streptomycin, the fifth and the last one, right? Apparently, it is in first line, first line drugs. But it is it is a thought that maybe in future it will shift to the second line, right? So it is something between first and second, you can say, right? It has been advocated that it should be shifted to second line. But currently, it is in first line. It is in first line only, right? So I'm starting this streptomycin. It is also siddle. So you can see all of them are siddle. It is also siddle. Only thamidol was taking. Rest all are siddle, right? It acts only against extracellular. You can see. It acts only against extracellular bacteria, not against intracellular bacteria. Give me a thumbs up. Right. It cannot kill intracellular. So that is the introduction. That is the introduction you have seen. After that, let me move to the mechanism of action. Let me move to the mechanism of action. What does it do? There are five drugs. Okay. Let me tell you mechanism of action here. Then I will come here. Uh, it inhibits protein synthesis inside the bacteria. So let me draw the diagram of a bacteria. We have already done in the last lecture in aminoglycosides. I have told you aminoglycoside, it is one of the amino aminoglycoside. This is mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the cell wall. It has nothing to do with cell wall. This is the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, this is the DNA. This is the chromosome's DNA. Now, I am interested in ribosome. Let me draw a ribosome. This is 30th unit of the ribosome. This is 50th. On the 30th and 50th, there are two windows, A window and P window, and this is mRNA. This is mRNA. On the A window, let me draw the two windows. This is P window and this is A window. You know there are two windows on the ribosome. The first codon always come at the P window. The second codon always fits at the A window. We know, we know that. Right. Now, amino acid synthesis takes place. In amino acid synthesis or protein synthesis, what is the first step? The first step is the initiation. Initiation means corresponding to the first codon, first amino acid will come here. Corresponding to the second codon, second amino acid will come here and then peptide-peptide bond formation will take place. And in this way, a chain of amino acid and protein, protein formation take place. So, aminoglycoside inhibit the P window. Aminoglycoside inhibit P window. It degrade the P window. So, initiation do not take place. The protein synthesis ka initiation, the first step do not take place. Protein synthesis ka initiation do not take place. Galti se initiation ho bhi gaya. If, if by mistake initiation is done, in some cases if it is done, then misreading will happen. Then misreading. You know the meaning of the misreading. The codon is coding for some amino acid, but someone else is coming. Just suppose the codon is AUG. It is coding for methionine, but instead of methionine, histamine, histidine is coming. So that is misreading. Anyone can come instead of anyone. So misreading will happen and some, some wrong proteins will be formed. Either protein will not form or some wrong will be formed. So that is inhibition of, it, 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 it will inhibit, they will freeze the initiation. And if initiation is done, they will cause misreading. And in, in the end, they are inhibiting protein synthesis. That's why bacteria is and static. And they bind with 30th ribosome also, 50th also, and junction also. Those who have attended my last lecture, they already know it. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Everyone. Shall I proceed ahead? Shall I proceed ahead? So 30th as well as 50th as well as 30 plus 50 both us. So in the diagram, this is the diagram of four protein synthesis inhibitor. Those who have attended my last lecture, again, again and again, I'm saying they know what it is. Right? Please watch the recording. Those who have missed it. So this one is streptomycin, that is aminoglycoside. Streptomycin is one of the aminoglycoside. This one is tetracycline. This one is chloramphenicol, right? And the last one is um, erythromycin or macrolide. So currently I'm talking about aminoglycoside, it inhibits the initiation, window P. Tetracycline inhibit window A, that is step number two. Currently I'm interested in this only, right? So that is the mechanism of action. Coming on the adverse effect. First we will compare the uh, mechanism of action of all five. H R Z E S. You tell me mechanism of action of all five in short. Who will tell me the mechanism of action of all five in short? First, tell me who are cell wall synthesis inhibitor. Among the five, three inhibit cell wall. The uh, isoniazid inhibit cell wall. Pyrazinamide inhibit cell wall synthesis. It inhibits cell wall synthesis. And ethambutol inhibits cell wall synthesis. R for R. Ripamcin inhibit RNA synthesis. And streptomycin is the aminoglycoside. That's why it inhibits protein synthesis. These are the basics. These are the basics. Yes, Ram Pravesh, absolutely right. It acts on 30th, 50th, as well as junction of 30th, 50th. Absolutely right. You can see the five things. The basics, the basics. Now tell me the gene which is mutated, if applicable. Tell me the name of the gene. Can you tell me the name of the gene in each of them? Isoniazid inhibit a gene. The name of the gene, I guess the name of the gene is INHA gene. And it codes for an enzyme. The name of the enzyme is FAS1 enzyme. This enzyme is required for the formation of mycolic acid. So mycolic acid is not formed. So cell wall is not formed. This is the complete story. Rifamcin inhibitor gene. The name of the gene is RAPO-B gene. Right. So this gene codes for an enzyme. 
The name of the enzyme is DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Right. So this enzyme is inhibited. So DNA cannot be converted to RNA. So RNA is not formed. This is the complete story. Coming on pyrazinamide. In pyrazinamide, the name of the gene is Pianca gene. So pyrazinamide inhibit Pianca gene. It codes for an enzyme. The name of the enzyme is FAS. Here be FAS2. My mistake. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. This was FAS2. This was FAS2 and here is FAS1. It, it codes for an uh, uh, enzyme. The name of the enzyme here is FAS1. So FAS1 will not form. So FAS1 is also required for mycolic acid. For mycolic acid, FAS2, FAS1 both are required. So mycolic acid is not formed because FAS1 is inhibited. So cell wall is not formed. This is the complete story here. Coming on ethambutol. Coming on ethambutol. Can you tell me what will be the story in ethambutol? In ethambutol, okay. Uh, it inhibits the gene known as EMBAB gene. This gene codes for an enzyme. The name of the enzyme here, I guess it is arabinoside gal galactosidase. That is the name of the enzyme. It codes for arabinosidase, arabinoside galactosidase, right? So it is also a component of the cell wall. So here also cell wall is not formed, right? In the end, coming on streptomycin. Streptomycin do not inhibit any gene. It do not inhibit any gene. It acts on the ribosome. Which ribosome? 30S, 50S as well as junction of 30 plus 50S, the junction also. It goes on the ribosome and it inhibits the P window of the ribosome, the P window. P window is required for initiation. So initiation will not happen. If initiation happen, then misreading will happen. So ultimately protein synthesis will not happen. This is the complete story in front of you. Yes, Arabino Galactam. Yes, thank you for reminding. I was missing this name. Yes, thank you. So this is the complete story in front of you. Give me a thumbs up. Is it, Was that a great job? Give me a thumbs up if you appreciate this effort. So this is how you have to learn the mechanism of action of the five first line anti-TB drugs. Right. So learn the basics. Which of them are cell wall synthesis inhibitor? Which of them are RNA synthesis inhibitor? And which of them are protein synthesis inhibitor? And learn the complete story. Name of gene, name of enzyme, the complete flowchart. And you can imagine the five diagrams. If you wish, you can draw the five diagrams. The beautiful five diagrams here you can draw by yourself. For your permanent memory. Shall we proceed ahead? We are done with mechanism of action of the fight. I was teaching you the last one. Streptomycin. Let me continue that. So adverse effect you already know. Adverse effect of streptomycin are same as that of aminoglycoside. I have already taught you the adverse effect of aminoglycoside. The mnemonic is on. Switch on wala on. O double N on. On HT is the mnemonic. So three toxicity. Right. Autotoxic, nephrotoxic, neurotoxic. The three toxicity. Along with hypersensitivity to sub hota na? hypersensitivity is always there. And T is teratogenic. Never give any aminoglycoside, including streptomycin, to any pregnant lady. Because the newborn will be deaf, congenitally deaf, bilateral deaf. So autotoxicity is there. That's why it is teratogenic. Now imagine a pregnant lady is coming to your clinic and she is having cough. She is having cough. And she is diagnosed case of TB. You have done a sputum test and she is diagnosed as TB. What treatment you will offer? Normal treatment. Does it include you? you whatever treatment you give, don't give streptomycin in that. Otherwise, it is teratogenic. The newborn will be deaf. Right? I will teach you dots. Everything. I will teach you dots. Right? So, shall I proceed ahead? So, we are done with the five. We are done with the five. Let me see. Few. Yeah. More charts I am having with me. You can see. Name among the five. HRs, ideas. Name the drug which is active against rapidly growing bacteria. Most active against the rapidly growing bacteria. The answer is isoniazid. Name the drug which is active against slow growing bacteria. The intracellular one. The answer is pyrazinamide. And name the drug which is active against sputters. Sputters, what are sputters? What are sputters bacteria which are present in necrotic material? You know there is granuloma. In the center of the granuloma there is caseous necrosis in tuberculosis. You may be knowing that. Some bacteria reside in that caseous necrosis. Those bacteria are known as sputters. The drug which want to kill sputter that has to go inside the necrotic material. Then only inside penetrating the necrotic material that bacteria can kill and only rifampicin can do such penetration. Give me a thumbs up. So three questions are there. Three answers are there. Give me a thumbs up. Right. Otherwise you know this. You know all of them are still except ethambutol which is stated. The first three are hepatotoxic. The first three. This is mild. This is moderate. This is severe. The last one are not hepatotoxic. And you know intra-extra, you already know. That is isoniazid, rifampicin, and ethambutol acts against both intra and extra. But pyrazinamide is only intra and streptomycin is only extra. I would like to draw the chart in front of you. And then we will do, let me see, these are the mixed poles. No? Okay, do these questions, then we will draw the chart. 
Okay, see this question also. Uh, this is the lag period after the exposure for more than 24 hours. Uh, that is post-antibiotic lag period. After how much time you are giving antibiotic to the patient, the, the drug to the patient. After how much time it will start acting. So see the hours. After how many hours? It is the longest for streptomycin. Streptomycin start acting after 8 to 10 hours. So that is a question. The longest lag period in the bacterial growth is for which of the ATT drug? So answer will be streptomycin. Right. Okay. Can you, can you do this question? A person is on one of the ATT drug. That is HRZDS. I don't know which one. But he is having deafness and tinnitus. After some time. Name the drug which causes deafness and tinnitus as a side effect. Can you tell me the name of that drug? I want to ask which is autotoxic among them. Autotoxic means cochleotoxic as well as vestibulotoxic. <laughs> autotoxic means deafness. Uh, cochleotoxic means deafness. And vestibulotoxic means tinnitus and vertigo. Uh, of course, you all are right. The correct answer here is streptomycin. Very good, very good. Nagasri, Gobezu, Kishore, absolutely right. So, correct answer here is A. Right. Before coming on the second line drug, uh, I would like to make a comparative table, the final master table between the five. And you all are going to help me there. Right. Even I get confused sometimes. So, you have to help me here. You all have to help me here. Let me draw the five columns. H, R, Z, E, S. A rough table just for revision purpose. Right. You have to tell me the introduction of all of them in a comparative manner. Right. After that, in short, you have to tell me mechanism of action. We have already discussed in detail. But in short, you have to tell me. Then you have to tell me the resistance, the gene which is resistance. Then you have to tell me important points in pharmacokinetics, if any if any applicable. And in the last, you have to tell me adverse effect, the most important adverse effect of all of them. Can you help me in the comparison? Any one of you, start with the introduction. Start with bacteriocidal or static. So only ethambutol is static, rest all are sidal. Sidal, 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 sidal. You know the meaning of sidal and static. The sidal one kills the bacteria. Static one do not kill the bacteria, it only inhibits the growth of the bacteria. So that is the first point you have to learn. Come on intracellular bacteria or extracellular bacteria. Which bacteria is killed? So, uh, isoniazid kills both. Rifamsin kills both. Intra plus extra. And ethambutol also kills both. Intra plus extra. But parazinamide kills only intracellular exclusively. And streptomycin kills only extracellular exclusively. After this master chart, I will give you a mixed question. And you will get confused. Right. So, learn this chart. Right. After that, tell me the rapidly dividing. Uh, and slow dividing and scooters, which is active. So again, rapidly dividing, against rapidly dividing bacteria, isoniazid is most active. Against spurters, spurters, rifamsin is most active. And against slow dividing, ethambutol, ethambutol or parazinamide, just confirm, I'm getting confused. I guess parazinamide. Parazinamide is most active against slow acting. So that is the thing. I, that is the thing. Right. After that, in, in the comparison between these two, uh, isoniazid is the drug which is, uh, okay, here act, you can act intermediate also, Kishore, right? Yeah, I know in the beginning I told you slow and intermediate, but slowest, slow ke liye best is parazinamide, Kishore. For slow dividing, the best one is the parazinamide. Uh, and for intermediate one, I'm not sure, but for spurters, the best is rifamsin. So that is the correction you can do. Uh, the earliest, the drug which convert the patient earliest, uh, non-infectious, earliest, the word is earliest, from infectious to non-infectious is isoniazid. But most potent among them is rifamsin. It is slow acting, but it is most potent. That's why it is the sterilizing agent. Sterilizing agent is only one that makes the bacterial count zero in the patient body. That is rifamsin. Isoniazid do not make the patient bacterial count zero. It only makes sputum negative. But inside the body, still bacteria are present. Inside the body, all the bacteria are killed by rifamsin in a slow manner. So that's why it is most potent, but slow acting. Right? So that is the thing. What is the drug of choice? Who is the drug of choice in treatment? Answer is uh, isoniazid. Who is the drug of choice for prophylaxis? Answer is isoniazid. I guess comparison is over. Shall we move ahead? Yes, absolutely right. It is the most potent. Yes, uh, rifamsin is most potent. Absolutely right. So introduction is already done. We have done the introduction. We have compared the introduction. If you have any extra point in the introduction for comparison, kindly let me know. I will write it here and tell others also to learn. So that is the only comparison I can do in the introduction. Now, let me tell you the mechanism of action of all five. So, isoniazid inhibits cell wall synthesis. Parazinamide also inhibits cell wall synthesis. Ethambutol also inhibits cell wall synthesis. R for R. Rifamsin inhibits RNA synthesis. 
and streptomycin is the amino glycoside that's why it inhibits protein synthesis i am not telling you the complete flow chart you already know that we have already discussed we have already discussed coming on resistance can you tell me the name of the gene which is resistance which 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 is mutated to show the resistance in isoniazid two genes are there cat g gene or inh a gene which which are mutated to show the resistance in rifampicin it is rapo b gene in pyrazinamide it is pnk gene in ethambutol it is emb ab gene in streptomycin there is no gene i don't know the name of the gene if any right coming on pharmacokinetics and adverse effect pharmacokinetics you can learn by yourself coming on adverse effect on the next page let me take next page so let me again draw the five columns h r z e s just tell me adverse effect of all that's it so the comparison will be over who will tell me the adverse effect the most important so first of all huh, write allergy or hypersensitivity everywhere hypersensitivity or allergy everywhere it is a common side effect of all now apart from it tell me others tell me other side effects right so i would like to say like uh, the first three are hepatotoxic this is mild this is moderate this is severe right the fourth one is renal toxic that is kidney toxic right so first three are hepatotoxic fourth is renal toxic the third and fourth both produces hyperuricemia or gout the third and fourth produces hyperuricemia and gout right now for the fifth one i am having a mnemonic on hd so i don't have to get confused this is on hd you know autotoxic neurotoxic nephrotoxic uh, hypersensitivity is allergy i have already written and teratogenicity so you know the full form that is on hd apart from it what are others you can tell me this is the comparative manner iske alawa kya kya hai what are others in isoniazid in others i would like to write peripheral neuritis due to vitamin b6 deficiency or pyridoxine deficiency number 1 and number 2 i would like to lie right hemolysis and g6pd deficiency g6pd deficiency am i right i guess i am i guess i am right uh okay one more point someone is telling me least toxic i forgot to write in the introduction ethambutol is least toxic you can do that in comparison other i will cover here in uh, in uh, adverse effect okay rifampicin the urine and all secretion convert red or red or orange not only urine all secretions convert red or orange that can be a side effect of the rifampicin apart from it flu like syndrome is a side effect of rifampicin apart from it blood dyscrasia is a side effect of rifampicin learn the others the one which are comparable compare them apart from comparable learn the others right in paracetamide no other side effect these two are the only one in ethambutol the most important is optic neuritis optic neuritis you cannot miss that you cannot miss that everyone give me a thumbs up shall i move ahead i guess i have covered everything shall i move ahead done shall i move ahead that is the adverse effect you have to learn like this coming on the second line drugs we are done with the first line drugs coming on the second line drugs these all are second line drugs but i am not going you uh, telling you the details here i am not going to tell you the details here that is etionamide cyclosporine tapriomycin tanamycin amikacin th thioacetazone and pas you have to learn their mechanism of action and main main adverse effect but really frankly speaking these are not very important for the exam but you should know the names now let's start dots the dots regimen for tuberculosis we know that dots is the treatment given for tb it is a regimen i will tell you what is the exact regimen it is given for the treatment of tuberculosis and it comes under rntcp act in, in india you know in india there is a program it is known as rntcp revised national tuberculosis control program rntcp dots come under that what is the full form of dots do you know the full form of dots what is the full form of dots d o t s what is dots d is directly observed short therapy it is directly observed short therapy short course treatment it's short course because it lasts for 6 months approx 6 months right that's why it is short why it is directly directly observed why it is not known as directly this is the logo for dots in india so it, this 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 diagram can come in your exam and that can be asked that is for dots short cure for tb you may be knowing that right so what is a dots in dots what is happening actually can you see a healthcare provider by healthcare provider is not necessary it is always a doctor it can be a nurse it can be anganwadi worker it can be asha it can be anyone i am saying any healthcare provider healthcare provider watches with his or her eyes that patient is swallowing the drug in front of him we will not give the drug for taking at the home first of all the drugs are provided free of cost in the hospitals in all government hospitals in all primary healthcare centers the drug will be provided free of cost 
If animal is diagnosed as TB, the government will provide the complete treatment free of cost. But there is a condition. The patient will take the tablets with water in front of healthcare provider. We will not provide tablets for home. That is the meaning of dogs. So that is directly observed. Directly observed therapy. A healthcare worker or a trained person watches the patient swallows each medicine in front of him. Right in front of him. So that is the thing. Have you got it? Have you got it? So shall I move ahead? Thank you. Really thank you for the feedback. Lazar, thank you for the feedback. So there are two phases in dogs. Intensive phase and continuation phase. What do you mean by that? Listen. In dots, this is the complete strip available in the hospitals. We will give the tablets to the patient and the patient take the treatment in front of us. Now, there are two phases, intensive phase and continuation phase. In intensive phase, our main motto is to make the patient non-infectious. I want to make the patient non-infectious. And in continuation phase, I want to sterilize the patient. Do you know the meaning of the two? I want to sterilize the patient. Now, there's a patient in front of me. He is diagnosed case of TB. He is diagnosed case of TB. He, he, I have done the sputum examination. And he is having TB. He is having TB. Now he is coughing. And with the help of droplets, he is spreading infections everywhere. So all the humans, all the other persons around him, in his family, in his workplace, everywhere, he is infecting everyone. I do not want that. I do not want that. Now these are the lungs of this patient. So bacteria is present in the lungs. The bacteria. And from the lungs, it is coming in the cup. So my first purpose is to make him non-infectious. By the word non-infectious, I mean sputum should be negative. Whether body is negative or not, not, not necessary. But sputum, sputum is negative. Sputum negative corrosive of cephalic. The droplet should be negative. Sputum negative. So that is the purpose of intensive phase. In intensive phase, I will give the treatment intensively. That is intensive phase. And I will make him non-infectious. That is the sputum will negative. So he, the, all the bacteria are not dead. Only the bacteria and the sputum are dead. Still, bacteria are present inside lungs, right? So, at least he is not spreading to others now. He, the, 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 the infection is limited to this person only. Now, I will provide continuation phase. In continuation phase, I will continue the treatment to, to make him sterilize. Sterilization means bacteria zero. Everyone, give me a thumbs up. Yes, I will use isoniazid. Definitely, they should. So, give me a thumbs up. Have you got the meaning of the two phase? Intensive phase and continuation phase. What is the purpose? What is the ultimate aim? What is the ultimate motto of the two phases? In intensive phase, my purpose is to make the patient non-infectious. And in continuation phase, my purpose is to make patient sterilize. Sterilization means uh, bacterial count zero in the body. Here, I want to make bacteria zero in cough, in sputum. So that spread in the community is spread. Here, I am going to do others. And here, I am going to do others. Right. Here, I'm more interested in, in treating, in preventing others. And here, I'm interested in the patient himself. So, pehle dusro ko bachao, fir usko treat karo. You got my point? So, that is the thing. That is the thing. So, there are two phases. Now, intensive phase mein, patient has to come daily to the hospital. And in front of healthcare provider, he has to take the treatment. So, daily he will come. The healthcare provider will give the treatment. You will give the tablets and he or she will swallow the tablets in front. In front of the healthcare provider that is directly observed. That is the therapy supervised in intensive phase. So, seven days are there in a week. In the week, Sundays treatment are not given. So, six days of a week, the patient has to come daily, daily for the intensive phase. But in continuation phase, patient has to come first day of the week, daily, once a week. So, just suppose every Monday, every Monday. So, every Monday patient will come. The first dose I will give with my hands. First dose will be taken in front of the healthcare provider, the Monday dose. From Tuesday onwards till Saturday, I will give five doses for home for one week, for one week. So, I will give you five doses to the patient. You can take to the home. You take the treatment till Saturday. On Monday, you come again and bring the empty strip. Bringing empty strip is compulsory. If you don't bring empty strip, I will not give the next treatment. So, again, next Monday, you bring the next empty strip. Again, I will give first dose in front of me and rest five doses for your home. You got So, in continuation phase, the patient has to come only once a week, not daily. So, it is written in front of you. Please read it. In intensive phase, all the treatment is under supervision. So, patient has to come daily. But in continuation phase, patient has to take the first dose of every week in directly observed and rest of the of them is given for the home. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. So, that is the thing. That is the thing. Right. Now, listen. There are two categories of the patient. Let me teach you RNTCP guidelines. That is DOTS regimen. This is DOTS regimen. There are two types of patient. Category 1 and category 2. Category 1 and category 2. How I teach you? Imagine there is a patient in front of me. He is, his main complaint is coughing. 
he is having cough since last few months he is having low grade fever evening rise of fever and he is having weight loss and he is a young 25 year old male and he is having cervical lymphadenopathy also right so it is a typical scenario of tb so i am having high suspicion that the patient is having tb right so i asked the patient to do the sputum examination you know what is sputum examination when he cough sputum comes out so i asked the patient to collect the sputum in a sterile container so three times sputum is collected you know the process you know the protocol so the first sputum is in the opt on spot collection this is known as on spot so as soon as just suppose now the patient is in front of me patient is coughing having all these uh, symptoms i am having suspicion i will say the patient go to the laboratory right now we have a laboratory in our hospital go there right now take a container for the sputum and submit your sputum in that container that is on spot collection the first and take two empty containers for home for home right the second sample you have to submit early morning the first sample so tomorrow morning when you wake up and you first time do cup so the sputum you collect the second time that, that, that will be your second sample so the first morning sample the next day and the third again the first morning sample the day after that just suppose today is monday so on spot monday is done so tuesday and wednesday the next two mornings the first sample so total three samples and after the, the collecting second sample and the third sample don't keep that at home submit it to the laboratory on the same day otherwise it will get degraded degenerated so once you collect the sample sub submit it to the laboratory so laboratory receives the microbiology laboratory receives three sample out of the three at least if one is positive i will label the patient as tb if all three are negative the patient is negative even from three even if one is positive anyone anyone so i will label the patient as tb i can start dots so that is a protocol right now starting dots is very typical starting dots so for starting dots i have to decide the category in which category i put the patient category 1 or category 2 so what is the protocol ask the patient are you a new patient so that you have you taken dots previously have you taken the five drugs hrz yes previously in your entire life you are 30 year 40 year maybe in your childhood maybe your mother have told you that whenever you were a kid you was having tb so in your knowledge in your history in your parents knowledge you have tb any time in your life any time if the patient is showing saying no till now there is no tb in my knowledge i don't have tb in ever in my life so he is a new case he or she is a new case that is category 1 the second possibility patient will say yes i was having tb few years back and i took the treatment complete treatment but unfortunately again i am having the tb so he is a relapsed case the relapse so he is a very unfortunate patient and he is having tb second third time whatever to relapse is there right number relapse is the possibility right and uh, there is a patient who is saying yes i was diagnosed tb few days back only 15 days back so i was treating taking treatment in another hospital right but the doctor they told me to take dots and that but, but i don't bother now i want to take the treatment doctor no so he is a defaulter he is a defaulter he has started treatment but he is not following it judiciously and in between he is leaving and he is coming again to us so it he is coming to us in the same course relapser or defaulter may there is a difference relapser may he was already complete treated declared treated on paper declared treated and now he is having again defaulter is in the middle of treatment and he just run away and he is coming again he is coming again so these both patient have taken the treatment previously so they are they are category 2 so different treatment is there the treatment protocol is different so here in category 1 total treatment will be for 6 months out of the 6 months 2 months will be intensive phase and 4 months will be continuation phase right so in intensive phase the 2 month patient has to come daily in the hospital for taking treatment in the continuation phase for the next 4 months the first day of the week every monday he has to come and uh, the first dose will be supervised and rest of the doses will be given for home have you got it you know that so total treatment i will tell you the name of the drugs so total treatment is 6 month two intensive phase the purpose of intensive phase is to make the patient non infectious sputum negative and at 4 uh, months uh, after the four uh, the, the continuation phase 4 month the purpose is to make uh, him sterilize to make the bacterial count zero in the body you get it yes or no in category 2 total treatment is given for 8 month not 6 8 month so what is 8 8 is 3 plus 5 it is 3 plus 5 by 3 i mean intensive phase and by 5 i mean continuation phase this 3 is further divided in 2 plus 1 so in the first 2 months i will give some different treatment in the next one month i will give some different treatment i will tell you what's the treatment but totally for 3 month patient has to come hospital daily because it is intensive phase and then in continuation phase uh, he has to come once a week every monday as i have told you now this i will tell you the drugs don't worry uh, after intensive what's the purpose of intensive phase in both of them 
have told you the purpose of intensive phase. The purpose of intensive phase to make the patient non-infectious to make the sputum zero. So it is a protocol at the end of intensive phase again do sputum test to confirm whether sputum is negative yes or no. At the starting of the treatment you have started the treatment because sputum was positive. That's why you have started the treatment. Say yes or no. You have done three sputum examination. One of them, at least one of them is positive. If all three are positive, it's good. Two are positive, it's good. But at least one of them is positive. The sputum was positive and you have started the treatment CAT1 or CAT2. Right. At the end of uh, intensive phase, it is a rule. If sputum becomes negative, then only start continuation phase. Otherwise, you cannot start continuation phase here also, here also. So here after two months, do sputum test. Here after three months, do sputum test. If sputum is negative, very good. You are successful in the treatment. Continue continuation phase now. We are successful in the first phase. Intensive phase is successful. So the success of intensive phase is just by sputum testing at the end of intensive phase in both categories. Now what if sputum is still positive? The patient may be unlucky. The treatment is not working. We have seen various type of resistance. Maybe the drugs are having resistance and it is the treatment is not working. That is, so in that case, uh, if it is CAT1, if it is CAT1 and sputum is positive after intensive phase, Continue intensive phase for one more month. So instead of two months, continue it for one more month, total three months. After three months, then again do the sputum. Now if it is negative, good. At least up to negative one, go for continuation. But if it's still positive, shift the patient to CAT2. Shift the patient to CAT2. That is the protocol. You got my point. And in continuation, uh, in this category two, if at the end of intensive phase, if sputum is positive, sputum is positive, here also continue for one more month. At least give a chance. Continue for one more, more month. So instead of three months, give it for four months. Then again do the sputum. Again two possibilities. Now become neg uh, negative. So it's good for us. So at least TK giving an extra month, at least it become negative. But still if it is positive, we will declare it as an MDR-TV. I will tell you MDR treatment separately. Let me finish first the dots, normal dots. MDR is dots plus. Let me first teach dots, then I will teach you dots plus. Give me a thumbs up. Come on, are you people listening or sleeping? Are you people listening? Avekan, have you got it? This is the protocol. Shall I come on the drugs now? Shall I come on the drugs now? See the same thing. This is a table from KDT, KD Triponti, right? So this is the latest guidelines, what I'm telling you. So CAT1 is a new patient. CAT2 is a previously treated patient. Now, previously treated can be defaulter, can be relapsed. You should understand the difference between a defaulter and relapse. But at least he is previously treated. He has taken the drugs previously. Give me a thumbs up. Are you people there? Sufi, Kishore, Amish, Daud. Are you people there? Lazar, Nagasri, Amar, Gobezu. Where are you all? Give me a thumbs up. Shall I continue? So, in CAT 1, as I have told you, the total treatment is for 6 months. For the first 2 months, we will give 4 drugs, HRZE. And for the next four months, we will give only two HR. That is the total treatment, six months. Very easy. HR is ready, HR. So HR is ready for the first two months and HR for the next four months. So total treatment is six months. That's it. And you have to give the treatment daily. Here patient has to come daily to the hospital. Here patient has to come once a week to the hospital, but treatment has to be taken daily. So that is CAT1. Very simple. HR is ready, HR. HR is ready for the first two months, HR for the next four months. Total six months. I will write it again in the flowchart. Don't worry. Coming on CAT2. In the CAT2, I have told you intensive phase is 3 months. But 3 months, again we divide 2 plus 1. In the first 2 months, give HRZES. Here HRZE, here HRZES. S is injectable. So ask the patient to come hospital daily. The, 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 the way trouble. The patient, it, patient will found it troublesome. So I have to come to the hospital daily. After that, give one tablet containing HRZE. All 4 things are in one tablet only. So that tablet, so patient will and give injection daily. S is the injectable. So you have to give one injection daily. daily. One tablet, one injection. One tablet containing four things. HRZE. One tablet containing four things. And one injection. For the first two months. And for the next one month. That I have split it into two into one now. For the next third month. Third month of the intensive phase. Injection is removed. And give only HRZE like CAT1. Like CAT1. Give only HRZE. In continuation phase. I am sorry. In continuation phase. Give for the five months. It is for five months. Give HRE. Give HRE. Let me write. Let me write. So, any patient coming to me, sputum positive. Sputum is positive. You know the symptoms. Patient is having cough, weight loss, low grade evening rise of fever, cervical lymphadenopathy. These are the symptoms of TB. I'm having suspicion the patient is having TB. I ordered sputum test. Out of the three sputum, at least one or more than one are positive. So, patient is declared as TB. I want to, I'm a doctor. I want to start dots. I will consult the patient. And I want to start dots. The first question I will ask the patient. Are you a new patient? Or you have taken the previous treatment? 
So if the patient is a new patient, newly diagnosed, never in life, till now he is having TB and he is treated with dots. So I will put him cat one, category one. And if the patient say, no, I have taken the treatment previously also. Now there are two possibilities, either he is a relapse or a defaulter, but he has taken previous treatment. So he is category two. So I will consult the patient in cat one. Let's finish cat one first. In cat one, the total treatment will be for six months. Out of the six months, we will divide it as two and four. Two is the intensive phase. And four months is the continuation phase. So I will consult the patient. You have to come daily to the hospital for the first two months. For the next four months, you don't come daily. Come every Monday. In the Monday, you will take first dose in front of us. And next of the five or six doses, we will do for home. Again, next Monday, bring the empty strip. And again, we will give you the next course. So that is your treatment. And none of them is injectable. None of them is injectable. So what is the actual treatment? In the first two months, you give HRZE. One tablet containing all four. We don't give four, tab four tablets. We give one tablet containing all four in a proper proportion. Right. And uh, in the continuation phase, we give only HR. I will tell you the doses also. Don't worry. Her cheese is but step by step. You need a up. Right. So that is the treatment. Right. And in, in category two, ask the patient, consult the patient, your total treatment will be eight months. Out of the eight months, you have to come three months daily. That is your intensive phase. And and four and the next five months, you have to come every Monday, the first day of the week. That is the continuation phase. Now, the three months, you will come daily. Maybe the first two months, we will give you one tablet, one injection. And in the next month, one month, we will give you only tablet, no injection. So that is the thing. You got my point. Now tell me the treatment. Tell me. So here in the first two months of the intensive phase, you are giving HRZES all five. That is the first four in the form of a tablet and one is injection, streptomycin. In the next, the third month, here in the third month of the intensive phase, you give only HRZ, no injection, right? And in the five months in continuation phase, you give HRE. Compare, compare the two categories. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Everyone. Have you got it? Does you have, do you have any problem? Please ask. Do you have any problem? Please ask. So have you got it? One more thing, the protocol I have told you about the sputum testing. At the end of the intensive phase, you have to check sputum. It is a rule. Without checking sputum, you cannot shift from intensive to continuation phase. You are shifting the patient from intensive to continuation phase after confirming that sputum become negative. Because the purpose of intensive phase was to convert the patient's sputum negative. That is to make the patient non-infectious. If the purpose is not fulfilled, you cannot shift to continuation phase directly. So do a sputum test here. If the sputum is negative, well and fine, shift it directly. Here also, here also. But if the sputum is not negative, extend intensive phase for one, one more month. Now, if it's become negative, it's good. If it is not negative, cat one will shift to cat two, cat two will shift to MDR. Give me a thumbs up. Come on. Have you got it? It was complicated, but I tried my best. Yes. So that is the complete dots. This is known as dots, right? This is known as dots under RNTCP guideline. These are the latest guidelines, right? These are the latest guidelines. You know what is intensive phase. You know what is continuation phase. You know what is sputum test. Category one is a new patient, right? The new patient who have never taken TB treatment in the past. Category two are either defaulter or relapse or failure, right? Failure can also be there. That is fail to respond. So three type of patients can be there. There is a difference in between them. But all of them have taken previous treatment. The guidelines are in front of you. Cat 1, Cat 2. Now next point is doses. How much milligram of each of the drug? H, R, Z, D, X. Tell me the milligram. Now there are two ways of learning. Either learn or kg wise. In India, what is the average weight of a person? In India, the average weight of a person is 60 kg. I'm, I'm assuming 60 kg as an average. Some are less, some are more. Right. So I'm talking about the India. Average weight is 60 kg. Right. For isoniazid, the dose is 5 mg per kg. 5 mg per kg. If the patient is 60 kg, so 5 into 60 will be 300 mg. So either learn this or, or this. Right. So if the if, if it in, the dose is 10 mg per kg. So 10 into 60 will be 600. Yes. Parazinamide, the dose is 25 mg per kg. So 25 into 60, it is 1500. Do it. Right. Ethambutol, the dose is 15 mg per kg. 15 into 60, it is 1000. Give me a thumbs up. So I learn like this. HRZE. S is injectable. Apart. SK doses, I have told you when I taught you aminoglycoside because it is having a narrow therapeutic range. So I taught you the doses, they are depending on the renal clearance. I'm not talking about S here. I'm talking about the first four HRZE. So the doses, I learn like this. I learn like 5, 10, 25, 15 per kg. And I multiply them with 60. So I multiply them with 60, the figures will come. So what is the dose of H, R, Z and E? Who will tell me? The dose for H, R, Z, E, if you talk about um, milligram per kg, or if you talk total milligram, not per kg, I'm assuming 60 kg. 
I'm assuming 60 kg, right? So tell me the doses. Who will tell me the answers? So it is 5 milligram per kg, 10 milligram per kg, 25 milligram per kg, 15 milligram per kg. It is 5, 10, 25, 15. Don't do the mistake. 5, 10, 15, 25. No, it's 5, 10, 25, 15 if you are not changing the sequence. Again and again, I'm saying the sequence is important. So there is a reason behind that. Give me a thumbs up. Come on. Right. So do multiplication by 16, all of them. 60, 60, 60, 60. What will be the answers? What will be the answers? Here, I guess it will be 300. Here, I guess it is 600. Here, 1500. And here, 1000. So on an average 60 kg patients, these are the drugs. Because I'm saying the four drugs are combined and one tablet is made. Right. So you should ask me, ma'am, how, how much you will combine in one tablet? So for an average patient, 60 plus minus 10 shall go. Right. It, it is not exact 60. If the patient is 65, you will say, I cannot give this combination. No. Plus minus 10 is okay. It is considerable. So instead of 50 or instead of 70, it will also work. So in this one tablet, there is 300 milligram of isoniazid. 600 milligram of Reformcil, 1500 milligram of parazonamide, and, and 1000 milligram of ethambutol containing one tablet. So I ask the patient to take one tablet daily. Come to the hospital, I will give you one tablet, take it. That's it. So on an average. But if the doses, if the weight is much varying, so combinations are not always possible. So patient, we have to give individual tablets in that case. If the weight is, just suppose the weight is 100 and patient is too obese or patient uh, is too thin, the weight is only 25, 30 kg, too thin. So both possibilities are there in that case combinations are not possible and we will give individual tablets. Give me a thumbs up. So that is about the doses. Now let's talk about resistance. Are you people interested? Shall I continue? It will take another 10 to 15 minutes but the topic will be finished. Right. So let's talk about the resistance of TB. Drug resistance. There are two types of resistance in TB. Have you heard about that? MDR, multi-drug resistance and XDR, extensive drug resistance. Multi-drug resistance, extensive drug resistance. MDR TB, XDRTB. Tell me the treat. Tell me the first definition. What does it mean? So let's start MDR. MDR. MDR kya hota hai? What is multi-drug resistance TB? MDR TB. MDR TB is such a TB in which the patient is resistant for H and R with or without others. But H and R is compulsorily non-active. They are resistant. Patient do not respond to H. Patient do not respond to R. The best two drugs. H is the earliest which convert the patient non-infectious and R is the most potent which make the patient sterilized. But both are non-active. The unlucky patient. The most unlucky patient. Right. So MDR-TB is such TB in which patient is not responding to H and R. Why? Because the bacteria have developed resistance against H by causing mutation in INH A gene or CAT G gene. And in R, the bacteria have developed resistance inside the body by RAPO B gene mutation. You know the way of resistance. So that's why the patient is not responding. So what to do? We have to treat the patient. We cannot leave the patient, right? So what is the treatment? Now the treatment will include other drugs, but not H, not R. So tell me the protocol of MDR. Tell me the protocol. So the protocol of MDR is known as DOTS plus. It is not DOTS. It is DOTS plus. Okay. So here total treatment will be for two years, 24 months, not six months, not eight months. In category 1. Now instead of 1 and 2, I guess category A and B is used. Right. So instead of category 1 or A, instead of 6 months. And category 2, that is 8 months. Here treatment is for 24 months. Can you understand the meaning of 24 months? Those are the treatments. The patient will take the treatment for 2 years, 24 months. Right. Out of the 24 months, the first 6 months will be intensive phase. And the next 18 months will be continuation. So half year will be intensive and 1 and half year will be continuation learned like that. Give me a thumbs up. So how many drugs you will give in intensive and how many you will give in intensive? So uh, in continuous, in intensive, we will give six drugs. We will give, no, none of them is H and R. And in continuation, we will give four drugs. So total 10 drugs are protocol. You have to learn the name. Most of them will be second line drug, right? Now out of the six drugs in intensive phase, you can see, just a second, out of the six drugs in the intensive phase, H and R is not working. What about Z? H, R, but the third one is the Z. Z, H, R, Z, E, Z and E we are giving. We are giving Z and E. H and R are not working. No, not H is working, not R is working because MDR is there. But Z and E are working. So give Z and E at least. At least give Z and E. Right. So Z is given, paracinamide E is given. So do to ye ho gaya. Streptomycin is not given. In place of streptomycin, carnamycin is given. That is a second line drug. Oflox is given. That is a second line drug. Ethunamide. Now there is a difference between ethambutol and ethunamide. Ethambutol is first line. Ethunamide is second line. Both are given here. Right, ethionamide is also given and cyclosilin is also given. So four second line and two first line, total six drugs are given. In continuation phase, only second line is given, the same four. So you can see Oflox, 
uh, etionamide, cytosine, and one of them is in computer. You have to learn it. I know it is complicated, but this is the simplified version I can tell you. So the summary is that in DOTS plus, that is an MDR TB. You have to give six drugs in the intensive phase, four in the continuation phase. Intensive phase lasts for six months, continuation phase lasts for 18 months. Total treatment is 24 months. Right? That is DOTS plus. Coming on XDR, that is extensive drug resistance TB. XDR TB. Coming on XDR TB. What is XDR TB? Patient is resistant to isoniazid, okay. Rifamsin, okay. So H and R to hey, like MDR, it is resistant to H also, R also, but also to fluoroquinolones. All Oflox, Levoflox, fluoroquinolones. Also by injectables, that is uh, that is the uh, aminoglycoside, capriomycin, carnamycin, amikacin. So from this, we cannot give the fluoxacins also, and we cannot give the uh, injectables, carnamycin, and these also. So what will left now? What is left to treat? We cannot give H, we cannot give R, we cannot give any of the fluoroquinolones from the second line, we cannot give any of the injectable from the second line or first line. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Everyone. So that is the patient is resistant with H, R, fluoroquinolone and one of the injectable. That is the definition of XDR. What is the treatment? There is no protocol. Because the most worst prognosis, hardly we can treat. So prognosis is the worst, worst prognosis. Hardly we can treat such a patient. That is the worst TB in the world. That is XDR, right? So we are unable to kill the bacteria. We are unable with any drug, the bacteria is not killed. So patient will not be treated, will not be cured, right? So complications will happen and death can happen. It is the worst treatment. What is the treatment? So a special committee will sit and that committee, expert panel will sit. An expert panel and committee will decide the treatment from the, I have told you one of the group is uncertain efficacy group 5. In the classification, I told you five groups, group one, two, three, four, group five is uncertain. From those, we will try, but it is hit and try, right? We, we, we are not sure whether it will work or not work. So that's all about it. You got my point? So tell me about the resistance. There are two types of resistance, MDR and XDR. What is MDR and what is XDR? MDR is multi-drug resistant TB. XDR is extensive drug resistance TB. Yes or no? So what is the definition? MDR, the patient is resistant with H and R. That's it. In XDR, patient is resistant to H, patient is resistant to R, patient is resistant to fluoroquinolones, and patient is resistant to one of the injectables, that is, that is aminoglycoside. Tell me the treatment in both sides. Here, treatment will be 24 months. Out of the 24 months, 6 months will be intensive and 18 months will be continuation. In intensive, we will give total 6 drugs. You know the names of the 6 drugs. In, in continuation, we will give four drugs. You should know the name of the four drugs. But here, no, no uh, treatment is fixed. An expert panel will sit and that will decide what drugs should be given. And that will be from category 5. And prognosis is very worse. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Are you people still there? Give me a thumbs up. The last thing. What if tuberculosis occurs in a pregnant lady? In a pregnant lady. In a pregnant lady, if tuberculosis occurs, always give CAT1 treatment. What is CAT1 treatment? Same as CAT1. Give the treatment for six months. Out of the six months, the first two months is HRZE and the next two months and next four months is HR. Same as CAT1, right? Don't give streptomycin. Streptomycin is teratogenic. Out of the five, HRZE is only S is teratogenic. Give me a thumbs up. Are you people there? So that is the thing. The last thing is the chemoprophylaxis. What you will give as a chemoprophylaxis? That is not for treatment. I'm asking for prophylaxis. Imagine the mother is diagnosed as TB and mother is lactating. She is breastfeeding the baby. So what you will give to the baby? What you will give to the baby, the lactating baby, the, the feeding baby. You cannot separate the mother and baby for six months or eight months, right? The baby is feeding. So you will give prophylaxis to the baby. The mother is, you will give treatment to mother. You will give prophylaxis to baby. In prophylaxis, we will give only isoniazid. Isoniazid is the drug of choice for prophylaxis. And the dose is 10 milligram per kg. That's it. The dose is 10 milligram per kg instead of 5 milligram per kg. That is the dose in treatment. So in treatment, isoniazid dose is 5 mg per kg. But in prophylaxis, it is 10 mg per kg. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Everyone. Are you people still there or gone? So everyone give me a thumbs up. I am done with TB. All about TB is done till now. Are you people there? Want some polls on the mix polls on the dots? Do you want some polls on the dots? Let me see if I can see your chat. Okay. So... There are some polls on the dots. We have completed dots. You have to write your answer in the chat box, right? If you feel like. So, give me a minute. So, this is the first question. Can you tell me the answer? Can you tell me the answer? Isoniazid is not given in which condition? Easy question, I guess. You know the side effects of isoniazid, adverse effect of isoniazid. Can you answer it? 
Can you answer it? As soon as it is not given in which of the following condition. I told you out of the five drugs H, R, Z, E, S, the first three are hepatotoxic. The first three are hepatotoxic, mild, moderate and severe. So yes, in liver disease, we cannot give isoniazid because it is hepatotoxic. Absolutely right, Kishore. Very good. Excellent. The correct answer is B. Right. So that is the thing. This is the next question in front of you. Yes, absolutely right. Everyone is right. This is the next question in front of you. If somebody develops resistant to isoniazid, right, patient will simultaneously develop resistance to which drug? Along with isoniazid, the next drug with, for which the resistance is common. Two drugs always show resistance together. Which two drugs? Along with isoniazid, what is the second drug which shows resistance? I told you MDR, the definition of MDR. What is the definition of MDR? What is the definition of MDR? Who will tell me the answer? Diana, Nagasri, Aswathi, Kishore, Prinoy, Amish. What is the answer? So correct answer here is, of course, Rifamsen. Very good, Nagasri. Yes. So H plus R, they always show resistance together. That is the definition of MDR. Yes, you all are right. The correct answer here is Rifamsen. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Right. So this is the next question in front of you. Okay. Yeah, tell me the name of the ATT drug, which kills slow or intermittent dividing bacteria. I told you clearly, slow, which kills slow or intermittent dividing bacteria. Tell me the name of ATT. Now you will get confused because I'm giving you mixed questions. So is it isoniazid? Is it rifampicin? Is it parazinamide? Is it streptomycin? What is your answer? Can you tell me the answer? Can you tell me the answer? What is the answer? Yes. So yes, rifampicin is the answer. That is active against slow or intermediately dividing bacteria. Right. Slow or intermediately dividing bacteria. That is the answer. Right. Coming to the next question. Can you tell me which statement is true about ethambutol? The true one about about ethambutol. Can you tell me? So it exclusively kills only extracellular. Is it true or false? It selectively sidal agent. Is it true or false? It increases the permeability of the cell wall. Is it true or false? And it is more active on slowly multiplying bacteria. Is it true or false? Tell me only one is true among them. Who will tell me the true one? I'm talking about ethambutol. I've told you there are five H, R, Z, E, S. Among the five, only ethambutol is static. Rest all are sidal. You know that. So this statement is wrong. It is not sidal. It is static. Right. I have told you that uh, this uh, kills both. Rifampicin also kills both. And ethambutol also kills both. Parazinamide kills only extracellular. And streptomycin kills only intracellular. I guess you know that. So this statement is also incorrect. It is active uh, exclusively against extracellular. No, it is active against both. So this is also incorrect. Right, Nagasri, why you are saying A? Why you people are saying A, B? I don't know what you people are saying. So have you got it? A is also wrong. It is not exclusively. How you can say that? It is not exclusively active against extracellular. You know very clearly it is active against both. So this statement is also wrong. It is not sigil because it is static. This statement is also wrong. Now the next two statement. It is active against slowly multiplying bacteria. This statement is true. This statement is true. It increases the permeability of cell wall. No, it inhibits cell wall. It do not increases the permeability of cell wall. It inhibits cell wall synthesis by inhibiting an enzyme. The name of the enzyme is arabinocyl galactosidase. Right. So it inhibits the synthesis of arabinogalactan. So cell wall synthesis inhibition is there. It do not increases the permeability. So this is also wrong. So first three statements are wrong. D is correct. Now everyone appreciates those who all are wrong. Everyone is wrong till now. No one told me D as the answer. So everyone, those who have told anything else, give me a thumbs up that you have realized your mistake. You have appreciated why? Why D is the correct answer? Why other three are incorrect? Give me a thumbs up. Shall I move? Yes? Okay. So coming to the next question. So this is the next question in front of you. Tell me anti-tubercular drug causing optic neuritis. It is easy one. I guess everyone should write. Everyone should be right. Tell me the name of the antitubercular drug which causes optic neuritis. Who will tell me the name of that drug causing optic neuritis? Yes? Yes, the correct answer here is ethambutol. Very good. Ethambutol is the drug that causes optic neuritis. Very good, very good. You all know that, I guess. Everyone knows it. Which of the following ATP is not bacteriocidal? Only one of them is not bacteriocidal. Only one of them. Rest all are bacteriocidal. 
I, I guess everyone knows the answer. Again, the answer is D. Only ethambutol is static, rest all are sudden. Right? So, you can see only ethambutol is static, rest all are sudden. Right? Which of the following ATT require dose adjustment in renal failure? That is renal toxic, kidney toxic. Which of the following require dose adjustment in renal failure? That is renal toxic or kidney toxic. So, I have told you there are five H, R, Z, E, S. The first three are hepatotoxic. The first three are hepatotoxic. The fourth one is the renal toxic. So, answer is again D, ethambutol. Yes, again D. Right? So, that is renal toxic. What is the dose of isoniazid in infants? So, dose is 10 to 15 milligram per kg oral. Not 10 to 15, it is 5 milligram. I'm sorry. The dose is 5 milligram of isoniazid. You know. Can you tell me the name of the ATT which blocks RNA? Which blocks RNA? I guess again an easy question. Everyone will be right. Name of the ATT which blocks RNA. RNA transcription. You know the name. Everyone knows the name. R for R. I guess R for R. Right. So RNA, Rifamsin. Rifamsin inhibit RNA synthesis. Right. So the correct answer here is A. I know I'm a little bit fast, but I want to finish the topic. In patients on isoniazid, which vitamin deficiency most likely occur? In patient on isoniazid, which vitamin deficiency most likely occur? The four options are in front of you. B9, B12, B6 or B3. Yeah. Uh, what you are saying, Nagasri? Not A. It is C. I guess by mistake you are saying. B6. B6 is the pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide. I don't know the spelling. Pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is the name of the uh, vitamin. Right? That is B6. That is B6. Always B6. Right? Can you tell me, okay, this is from second line. Can you tell me the name of the ATT which causes depression and suicidal tendency? So answer please learn. It is cyclosurin. It is a second line drug. Can you tell me the name of the drug, ATT drug, which is contraindicated in a pregnant lady? Only one is uh, contraindicated in pre pregnant lady. Only one is contraindicated in the lady, in a pregnant lady. Can you tell me the answer? In pregnancy, streptomycin is contraindicated. That is teratogenic. I told you that was in fact O double N H T H T H T ka T is teratogenic because it causes deafness in the child. So the correct answer here is C. Correct answer here is C, not A. Correct is C. Right? So that is the answer. Autotoxicity is caused by autotoxic. Autotoxic is again streptomycin, that is aminoglycoside. So let me stop now. There are many questions, endless questions. Right? Okay, last one. ATD causing hyperuricemia. Gout. Two of them causes gout. I have told you there are five. H, R, Z, E, S. Third and fourth causes gout. Z and E. So what is given in the option? I guess Z is given. So correct answer here is B. Correct answer here is B. Right. You all are right. I am done with TV. Leprosy, I will take in the next session. So anti-leprosy, anti-malaria, anti-viral and anti-protozoa. Four chapters are still remaining. Again, it will require another two to three hours. So soon I will schedule the session on that. Thank you very much for being with me. Don't forget to click on the like button if you have learned something from this session. Don't forget to share the link with your friends, colleagues, everyone. And uh, give your feedback in the comment box. You are free to write your feedback, whatever you feel like in the comment box. Your feedback is really very important for me. Thank you very much for giving your precious time to me. Tomorrow I am having sessions. And tomorrow I am going to cover in pathology. The, the sessions will be not on YouTube tomorrow. Tomorrow all the sessions will be on special class of an academy. All the sessions are free there. You can you, ha you have to install an academy app, an academy learners app. And on that neat PG category, my sessions will be free like YouTube only. The sessions are free. The only thing you require a code to unlock it. If you are a newcomer on an academy learners app, the code you can use this my surname. That is S C H D E B such Dave Tan. My surname is Sachdev, Dr. Priyanka Sachdev. So Sachdev Tan is the code to unlock. You can use this code and on an academy app, there will be many sessions on interesting topic tomorrow. So on microbiology, general microbiology, immunopathology, many sessions I'm going to take tomorrow also since morning only. You please attend that. Uh, I, will, I will provide you the links on the Telegram and WhatsApp. On an academy, new batch for 2023 NEET PG preparation is already there. If you want to attend the lecture, you have to take the subscription for that and you can utilize the lectures of this batch. For repeaters, TND, test and discussion uh, test uh, batch is already there. You can participate in that also. Iconic prizes are going to hide soon. So if you want to take subscription, take it soon. On an academy, there are five types of subscriptions available. In plus, you will get only an academy. In iconic, you will get an academy and prep letter. In light, you will get only test series. In proper, you will get anatomy, biochemistry and physiology. In UPSC subscription, you will get UPSC. 
whatever is your requirement, need, wish, preparation. According to that, you can select your plan. According to various durations and prices, you can see in front of you. If you apply my code on any or one of them, you will get straight forward 10% discount. My code is my surname only, Sachdev, Dr. Sachdev. So S-A-C-H-D-E-V, Sachdev without space 10 to get 10% discount. So maximum discount is 10% only that you can get applying my code before payment on any of these. Thank you. Bye-bye. Study hard. All the best. Good night.